have a whole bunch of corn snakes coming out. If you have any idea of what corn snakes you like or you've seen uh, what corn snakes I have and they're not on the website yet, feel free to reach out. And uh, I probably have quite a few animals that aren't on the website yet. I've been trying to play catch up here and it's been a little bit tough. And if you could also go and check out Snake Discovery, go follow them on YouTube. I know you already do, but also check out their available animals. Um, they're doing great work. Other than that, I really am excited to get into our show this week. So you have seen today's guest on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, The Today Show, Eastbound and Down, iCarly, Steve Harvey. He's all over the place. He is an animal expert and educator. Jeff Musial, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Joe. What's up, brother? How are you? I'm doing good. I conveniently popped you up right where you, right when you were taking a sip of your coffee. Hey, you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to keep it going here, man. I'm trying to stay awake, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. So if you don't mind, just give us a little overview of what you do and then kind of how you got started in this. Um, sure. Uh, I started this probably, well, ever since I was a kid, I was just always into reptiles and always into just anything, anything animal wise, you know? And it was so funny because I think it all started, like I was probably like, uh, I think I was 12 and I was in like Hills department store. I mean, this goes back, right? And then there was like this little Flintstone, like uh, plastic terrarium set up. And like, I, you know, I begged my parents for it. I got it. And then they're like, you gotta put, you know, I gotta, I gotta put something in it. And I got like a little Bribrons, I think it's how you say it, Bribrons gecko. And I had it in there for like ever. And then when I turned like 14, I start working at a pet store. My dad knew the owner. So I start working at a pet store. And rather than getting paid every week, I would just come home with like different animals. So I'd always have like, I had an iguana and then I had like a spiny tail iguana. And then I had, you know, tortoises and it, it was just crazy. But then from probably 14 on, I never wanted to work a job where you had to like tuck your shirt in. So I just kept working <laughs> at pet stores and uh, worked at all kinds of different pet stores. And when I got older, I ended up going to college for animal management up here, uh, Niagara Community College up this way. And I ended up taking a small business management course and some things like that. And, and then, you know, my sister was a teacher. My brother was a uh, teacher who ended up being, a, he was now a state trooper. And my dad was like, what are you going to do for a living? And I'm like, I'm going to do animal shows. And he's like, what? And he was the one that gave me the idea. He's like, you know, you know, like Bozo the Clown. You could be like Bozo the Clown, but bring all kinds of animals. I'm like, what? He's like a big safari hat and big shoes. I'm like, that's stupid. Um, but in a funny way, it's not. So without the dumb, you know, big shoes and goofy hat, why not? So that's what I decided to start doing. And I started a company called Nickel City Reptiles and Exotics. Well, it was Nickel City Reptiles forever. And then I added the exotics in a couple of years later. But I was always like a huge, huge reptile junkie. I've always had all the animals and every, a little bit of everything. And then when I turned this into my business and my job, then there was an excuse to get even more stuff. And uh, it was crazy because I was like, probably 17 years old. I don't even know if he knows this, but Kevin from Nerd, one day I saw like in Reptiles Magazine, like reptile parties and all that. I was like, this is crazy. I wonder what animals he uses. So I called up like 17 years old, 18 years old when I was thinking about maybe doing this. And I got Kevin on the phone, which was crazy. So he must've just like answered it. I'm like, hey man, I'm thinking about doing reptile parties. And this is like some little punk kid calling up Nerd, you know? And he's like, oh, really? This is what you need, an alligator snapping turtle and a rhinoceros iguana. He didn't even want to sell me it. He's just telling what, what I need for shows. And he's like, don't get this and this because people don't care about that. They want to see this and they want to see that and get an alligator and do this and do that. And it like, you know, shouts out to Kevin from Nerd because next thing you know, I got everything he recommended and my shows just like took off. People were like, you know, looking at living dinosaurs, like rhino iguanas and you know, it's funny because he gave me all these like things to get. And then I called up. I'm like, do you got any for sale? He's like, no. I'm like, what about what about alligator snapping turtles? No, we don't have those. I'm like, OK, <laughs> well, what about alligators? Yeah, I can't get you those right now. We don't have any. I'm like, OK. So, you know, I started kind of working magic and talking to people and trying to get uh, different animals, which I did. But, yeah, he kind of gave me the ideas for the things to to hit home runs with, you know, get a blue tongue skink before everyone and their mother wanted to breed them, you know, and they were 75 bucks a piece or whatever. and 
So you started, must have snuck in there before New York put in a bunch of regulations on, say, alligators. You, you know what's so crazy was? I was 17 years old, and my parents, there was a guy, he was like a lawyer that used to come into this pet store that I worked at. And he was like, hey, do you want some eyelash vipers? And I'm like, what? He's like, eyelash vipers. I'm like, yeah, this is crazy. Sure, I can have these. And he's like, yeah, there's no laws in New York. I'm like, okay. So I like begged my parents, and my mom's like, Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'm living at home still. Had the whole basement of their house I took over. And uh, there's no laws in New York. And they were like, you know, my parents are like, I hear my mom and dad talking in the room. My dad's like, well, he doesn't drink. We don't have to worry about him doing drugs. You know, let him get some snakes. And I'm like, now I look at it and I have a 10 year old son. I'm like, there's no way in hell, no way in hell I would let my kids have venomous snakes. But my, right. I don't know what happened or how it happened. But my parents are like, go ahead. So I got some, I was like, 18 i think i was 18 years old still i I was 18 before the laws passed and i got like eyelash vipers and white lips vipers and and pygmy you know rattlesnakes and western diamondbacks all from like this lawyer dude that used to come in a pet store and breed stuff and like he'd bring them in here you go and give them to me in like a jip peanut butter container and uh (laughs) crazy like knock on wood i've never been bit never been bit don't want to be bit um but i still have you know, a lot of those snakes today, I still have like my gaboons and stuff that are, some of them are over 20 years old. Like it's crazy, but, um, yeah, man, it, it was, uh, it was wild, but uh, yeah, my dad helped me get an alligator permit when I was like 16 years old. My, he signed on it and yeah, it's, since now I've had, you know, my permits now for God, 25 years or something. It's insane without giving out how old I am. But, um, you know, it's uh, it's been a long time, man. It's been a long time, but yeah, now New York's a whole different ball game. But you know, I I do a lot of stuff. I help DEC out with a lot of things when they need stuff or need someone to come in and remove something or, you know, whatever. I try to help out where I can and, you know, just play by the rules, play by the books. You know. Yeah, I'm sure you're one of a, a pretty small handful of people that have permits for that kind of stuff. So when they do have problems, <clears throat> or you know, you're on a short list. Yeah, there's not many. You know, I think it's like I when I renew my permits every year, the venomous permit is like number 104 or something like that. And I'm like, there's no way there's 100 people in New York State with venomous permits. So it's probably like maybe 10, but they couldn't start mm-hmm. with like zero, zero, four. So it was like 104, <laughs> whatever, you know, 102. I don't know. So it's just, yeah, it's it's pretty wild, man. It's been a long, crazy ride. Do you remember your first show? Doing my first show? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because I dressed up like every animal guy. Like you just got off the plane from Africa. So you had to wear like the cargoes. And I went and got like Dickies. And now when I look at a picture of it, I saw a picture my mom showed me the other day. I almost look like I just got out of jail. Like these like tan dicky shirts, Dickies pants. I didn't even have them embroidered yet um, or in my logos or anything on them. And I had like a tan hat and a tan shirt and tan cargo pants. And I look like I just got out of prison or I was on like work release, cleaning up garbage on the side of the road or something. It was, it, it was the weird, you know, but then I, I kind of, you know, got my own kind of style with stuff, but uh, it, it didn't have to dress like I just got off a plane from Africa, but they, um, yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was, it was, uh, it was one of those things like I did it and I'm like, you, I don't know if you, you get like a moment, like when you're doing something in life and it just hits you like, this is what I was born to do. That's what hit me. Like, I remember sitting there. I remember looking at, I'll never forget. There was a aunt, this lady there. I think it was like the birthday boy's aunt. And she like looked at me and I can still picture her in my head. And she's like, you were born to do this. And I'm like, this is crazy because I just had like this overwhelming feeling of it. And yeah. And I've been doing it ever since, you know, I just, I just think animal education is a huge, huge thing that, you know, is what well, animals are awesome. But if you can educate people about them, it's even better, you know? Absolutely. So was that uh, always your full-time gig? When did it become full-time? Did you ever have to tuck in your shirt per se? No, man. That's like, maybe I did. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's so funny because it was like, you know, you go by these things in life, like these things you're supposed to do, go to high school, go to college, graduate college, and then get a real nine to five and just play with your reptiles i was gonna say play with your snakes that would be weird and uncomfortable um play with your reptiles like on the side or whatever but i was kind of always like 
you know, I was a big skateboarder, snowboarder growing up. And, they, you know, I'll never forget, like, my uncle would be like, time to hang up the boards, you know? You're, and I'm like, I probably would have stuck with that for life, you know, if I didn't have people, like, telling me what I should do. So I just kind of was like, you know what, dude, I love animals. And my first thing was I was going to go work, uh, actual get a job doing this. And and I was I wanted to do something like work at, like, Alligator Adventure. Shouts out to Alligator Adventure down in Myrtle Beach. Um, and then I was looking into working at other zoos and stuff, but I interned with zoos and that in college. And I just didn't like a lot of the politics that went along with it. So this, I was, I was trying to make this a job, but I used to DJ, like, dude, I did everything. Like Fuck you yeah. name it. <laughs> I used to DJ house music. It was DJ Muse. And I used to DJ yes. this place called called the zoo bar okay how appropriate it's like from like two till four in the morning and then i would do this place called java records like after hours i'm talking like technique 1200s and vinyl none of this like beat matching you sit there and poke buttons like this was like you actually had to have some kind of skill to like match up records and stuff and i would do that at night do parties on the weekend and, you know, my dad's like, you need to get a real job. I'm like, dude, I just made 400 bucks DJing for a night. And then I went and did a couple parties and made this much. And then, you know, I'm looking at my brother, like a friend of mine. And he's like, I made $375 this week after taxes. And I'm like, screw that, man. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to make this work. I feel like there was no, I was not going to let it go. Like, I was not going to be like, okay, because so many people would be like, sometimes you got to know when to you know, hang it up and get a real job and do, I'm like, nah, man, this is, this is going to be, I'm going to make this something. I don't know how or what, but I'm going to do it, you know? And, um, it was funny because I always hustled, man. I was always hustling, trying to hustle. And, and, uh, this one morning I was driving, here we go. This is cuts back in the, sorry, I'm all over the place, but cuts back into what you're saying that I work a normal job. I used to drive auto parts around because up here we had a Chevy plant and a Ford plant, and I drive these auto parts around while I was going to college. And I was graduating college, and everyone's like, what are you going to do? You need to get a real job. And I was doing some of these, you know, reptile shows on the weekends and stuff. And a local radio station did this thing where they're like, you know, the morning show. They have, like, the guy, the girl, and then some random guy or girl that they, like, tease and make fun of. And they're like, what are we going to get Wheeze for his birthday? So I called in with the company phone. This is, like, old school flip phone, like, 99 cents a minute. And I know that because they took it out of my check after this was all over and done with. But um, I called in. I'm like, you need to get them a reptile birthday party. And they're like, what? I'm like, a reptile birthday party. I'm going to bring snakes to your house and alligators and tortoises. And their kids are going to feed them. They're going to eat your lawn. And this is going to be crazy. And they're like, what? She kept me on the phone for 17 minutes on a morning show. And that next that day, that next hour, I got – it was so funny because they're like, what's your number? So we, people can get in touch with you. And all I had at the time was a sky pager. So I was like, <laughs> oh, they're like, what's the name? I'm like, Nickel City Reptiles. Because if I opened a zoo, I was going to call it like Nickel City Reptiles. Buffalo, where I'm from, is in Nickel City. So I gave out my pager number and told them, like, you can reach me at this number. Book your birthday parties now. And I hung up. I called my pager with my work phone. And I changed it. I'm like, you reach Nickel City Reptiles. Leave a message if you're interested in the birthday party. 157 calls. 154 bookings that next day. I didn't even know what the hell to do because I was doing like a party on a Saturday, one on a Sunday, you know, and just like DJing and, and singing in a hardcore band and trying to just figure out my life, you know. But yeah, dude. Wow. So that was the power of radio back then. Yeah, it was insane. It really was insane. Like I said, people were calling up. We'd love to have you. My son's obsessed with animals in Jurassic Park and reptiles and yeah it was you're not kidding man it's like uh the power of radio people everyone listening they're having it on at work or whatever and and i'll never forget that i went into work on that monday morning and i handed them the keys i handed them my little shirt and i'm like dude i'm quitting and they're like what and i went home and I, my dad i'm like i quit and he's like you did what i'm like i quit what he's like what are you gonna teach people how to pet alligators for a living and i'm like <laughs> yeah i guess so let's go for it you know and he was like not in my house not in my house. And then fast forward, you know, 20 years later, he walks around with the Tonight Show zip up on with his name on it. He's like, oh, you know, my son, he's on the show. My son, the animal guy, that's my. So now he's like the proud dad that was telling me to get a real job 20 years ago. So, 
Yeah, dude, it's a pretty wild ride. You're getting me reminiscing here of all this stuff I haven't thought about in years. So sorry what if, if I'm babbling. No, 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 it's awesome. What if you were just getting started now? I mean, do you have any advice for people? I'm sure there's plenty of people listening who are educators or are thinking about it. Yeah, man, like uh, if you're really thinking about like doing it, do it the right way. I've seen a lot of people fly by night, see what I do in the area, and they go and just get animals, do stuff. Like, I got insurance. I got all the proper permits. I have a um, – at the time, I had a my parents' basement, but then it turned into a, a, a detached garage, and then it turned into my warehouse that we have now. But just do things the right way, first and foremost, if you're going to do it. And, and don't be fly by night. There's a lot of people that just think like, oh, man, or, or they hear like, you know, you make this much an hour doing a show. I'm going to do that. And it's like, you, you got to like weigh everything into it. You know, you got to you got to do that. You got to choose the right animals. Like it was funny, but like Kevin really nailed it, man, with like he's like, I, w- I didn't even like bugs, but he was like, get a Mexican red knee tarantula. And I'm like, Okay, I never even handled one of those. Dude, I still have them. I still have one, two. I'm looking at a rack of them in my hallway here. I still have five of them that are over 20 something years old. And we would use those and emperor scorpions and, and, you know, get the right animals. Because I think a big thing that a lot of wildlife educators mess up with, and I was one of them, you know, but like, not only is this like your, my job, but it's my love and it's my passion and it's I'm all about eat, breathe, sleep animals and, and, and doing this and, and just education all the time. And a lot of people that are in this are like, dude, I'm going to go do a party and I'm going to bring green tree monitor and black tree monitor and yellow tree monitor and a water monitor. And no one gives a shit. Yeah. <laughs> no one cares. You bring a monitor, a big ass water monitor flicking his tongue out of the top of the box. We have a big one named Sal. Uh, who doesn't have a water monitor named Sal, right? And um, his tongue comes out, people love it. But if you bring out another monitor, no one cares. You know what they're mm-hmm. going to say? Is that an iguana? Is that an iguana? Is that an iguana for everyone you bring out? So, like, my big advice is get a good mix, you know, like uh, scorpions, tarantula, alligator, snapping turtle. One tortoise is all you need. I've seen these educators, they bring out 15 tortoises. No one cares because everyone's going to look at it and go, is that a turtle? What kind of turtle is that? Does it swim? You know, that's a big turtle. Is that a snapping turtle? So it's like we always used a big sulcata, man, that we rescued. Someone gave it to us years ago, and we've had them forever. And now I got a herd of, of sulcatas that people have given us over the years. But, um, you know, pick one animal from each group, a good one, and go with it. Like green iguanas, I always felt guilty doing shows and bringing out things that people could see at Petco. Like I remember one time I brought out like a bearded dragon. And, and like when I was getting into the mammals and I changed my name to Nickel City Reptiles and Exotics, which is another whole story, um, I brought out like a ferret and a chinchilla because I didn't have like all my permits for all these crazy mammals yet. And I'll never forget this one guy's like, wow, a bearded dragon, a ball python, a chinchilla and a ferret. We could have just went to Petco. And that scarred me for life. It scarred me. It <laughs> He's not wrong. Me. It, yeah. I know. It scarred me so bad. So like I was like, man. Yeah, and he's like, it just really, it's like one of those things when someone tells you something and you're like, it just it sticks with sticks. you. Yeah. yeah. So I love bearded dragons. My son has one. I always have a couple. Like, I'll go get dog food. My bearded dragons pass on and I'll be like at a pet co and I'm like two awesome little orange bearded dragons there or something. They're like, they're getting too big for their three inch by three inch cubicle. Do you want them dirt cheap? And I'll take them and raise them up. I just, I love bearded, but it got to the point where I'm like, all right, I'm not going to bring them out to shows because I feel like I'm cheating people. You know, I feel like, okay, you're doing a show, bring out an alligator, bring out an alligator snapping turtle, it, wherever you're located and, you know, get the right permits to get these things. But, you know, bring out one big snake, bring out a tortoise, bring out some bugs, bring out like, I, I've always gone like crazy. Like I, I look at the old encyclopedia of reptiles and I always wanted a shingleback skink. Well, I have one. I've had one now 15 years. It's one of my favorite animals I've ever owned. You bring it out and people are like, what the hell is that? You know, and I just always like these things that just people's jaws drop. They're like, what? Like, what? You bring it out, you know, and not only the reptile people, but like the the regular pet people and animal people freak out over. So I just want to always create like that awe, like, holy cow, you know, like, so I I guess I tell people just, 
I guess my whole philosophy in life has been like, go big or go home. You know, like it's cool. You can do shows with smaller animals. I know some people out there are going to be like, oh, this guy's an idiot. Like you use ball pythons and bearded dragons are fine. And I, I guess they are. I mean, if that's what some of these people want to use, that's cool. But to me, just when I, when I started doing shows, when the guy said that to me, it scarred me and I felt like I was cheating people. You know, I felt like people are paying good money. Give them something that they're not going to see every day, you know? So, you know, just kind of get the right permits, do the stuff by the book, get your insurance and uh, get some cool animals, you know? Absolutely. So what was really your first big break as far as I'm sure you started doing, doing birthday parties, doing schools and libraries and all those things, but what was your break into TV? I used to bring the, well, here's going back to where, here's the other thing. For years, I kept pushing stuff to get on TV with reptiles and nobody cared. They're like, do you have a bear? Do you have a tiger? Can you get us a monkey? You know, and I'm like, well, no, but I got an alligator. And they're like, no, do you have, you know, can you get us a rhino? And I'm like, what? Because the TV producers are just like, you know, can you walk an elephant through the doors? You know, which I ended up doing later on in life. But um, I was like, okay. So I tried and tried and tried. It wasn't until I changed the name of my business to Nickel City Reptiles and Exotics. My girlfriend at the time, who's my wife now, and this is why I married her, she was like, hey, she like, you know, gets online or whatever she did at the time. She's like 89% of, of, of school teachers are women. I'm like, okay. She goes, women don't want to look at snakes and creepy crawly things. And I'm like, mm. and I'm like, okay, kind of get it. She goes, you get furry things, you're in, you're going to do every school. And she goes, and then you can put your reptiles in there and educate about everything. Boom, dude. It took off. I started doing no, like tri-state area. And we changed it to Nickel City Reptiles and Exotics. I got my USDA permit. And then we just started getting different mammals. And then I, I'm different than your typical like TV animal guy. A lot of these guys, 99% of them don't even own a dog. Like I eat, breathe and sleep, live this. Like I, I'm, before I did your call, I was scooping um, camel poop. Like camel poop and checking pouches of kangaroos for babies and make sure everyone's okay and bringing in llamas. I almost got killed by a llama. And, um, cause he gets all excited and flipping around. And so we brought all them in cause it's getting dark here. And, um, a lot of these guys, they don't do it. They don't have the animals. They don't put it in the time. They just call someone and borrow their animals. So I would do this all the time. And we raised animals in my house. And I had like a lemur that I got from a friend that they had a baby. And he was like, dude, they're both boys. I don't know how they had a baby. And I'm like, what? He's like, they had a baby. I'm like, a, a boy lemur? He's like, yeah. I'm like, dude, you don't have a boy lemur then, okay? <laughs> so he's like, I don't know what to do with this thing. We fed, we syringe, he gave it to us, and we syringe fed that thing. And um, we named him Zabu, like Zabumafu. And uh, he's like 25 years old. I still have him. But we hand raised him. Um, and it, it was unbelievable. But we spent so much time with these animals, and they went everywhere with us, and they'd be running around my house with diapers on at the time, not like everywhere but like a lemur and then we end up getting a kinkajou from someone that made a bad life decision and then we got a like a you know a coat of mundi from someone that bought it lived in an apartment it's like what are we gonna do this thing's like a cyclone so we get these things from people raise them up and spend so much time with them that i was like mr mom so we started handling all them and one day um there was a storm in new york city um in the whole you know new york area and flights couldn't get in and jeff corwin was um, on Conan O'Brien show. And a friend of a friend called me and they're like, dude, can you get to New York city tomorrow and bring animals? And I said, Oh yeah, for what, what do you need? And he's like, furry things, reptiles, give me a list of what you have. I go, okay, what's it for? Like a commercial or what? And this is like the first big break we got in the, the, the TV world because forever we pushed it and they just didn't care about reptiles, you know? So we finally had the mammals and stuff like that. And I said, you know, I got a shingleback skink and I got a North American porcupine and we got a coat of Mundi and a giant alligator snap and turtle, like a monster. This thing is huge. Um, we have two of them now. A friend of mine called me in Louisiana years ago and was like, dude, they're going to cook them down here. I'm like, tell the guy you'll give him 200 bucks for it. And he did. And he brought them home and his wife was pissed because it was in the back of their minivan in a potato sack. But we still have them. Tonka and Bulldozer, their heads the size of a basketball. I mean, they're incredible. They eat Cornish hens. But anyway, 
Um, I'm all over the place, dude. They um, they called us up and they were like, okay, can you be here? I drove a rented minivan through a blizzard, not thinking it was a blizzard. I'm like, oh, we can make it. Buffalo doesn't even have snow, which is crazy. And we got all the way to like an hour outside New York City. And then it took us three hours to get into the city and um, through the snow. But we got there and we brought animals for, for Jeff Corwin. And when we got there, Jeff was like, okay, well, is the porcupine going to like quill me? And I'm like, no, no. Like, what's he going to do? He, is he okay? I'm like, yeah. He's just sitting on the table. I said, yeah, but he's not like whipping around and trying to hurt you. And I'm like, no, I'm like, listen, man, all these animals are going to be different than anything you ever handled. This is like my family. These are my family members. Like I can hand you anything. And he goes, what about that fox? I had this Arctic fox named Tundra. I go, she's great. She'll lick your face. He goes, no, 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 no. Really, really. I'm going to bring her out there. I don't want problems. I said, she's incredible. Picked her up, handed it to him. Strangers. He's holding her and she's licking his face. And he's like, oh my God, like, this is incredible. Like, so word kind of spread with the TV animal people. Like, you know, cause when you're on TV, it's already stressful going out there. You don't want to have animals that are stressed. You don't want to have animals that are going to do something to make you look bad or hurt somebody or anything like that. So you want things that are desensitized to everything. And I would get my animals, like I'd have my animal out, have my wife pop a balloon or turn a radio on, have my kids turn things on. So they're used to everything. They don't care. Dogs barking, nothing. It's funny because people will be like, oh, these animals on TV, they're stressed. I'm like, no, they could care less. They really could care less. They actually enjoy it. They're looking around, checking things out. Um, so we started bringing animals for him. And then he came back on again and he reached out to us and we brought animals to them. And then we had a call from, um, I think it was Dave Salmoni. We brought some animals for him and we brought some animals for a couple other people. And I was always like a goofball, like always. Like that's just me. What you see is what you get. And I was in the hallway and I think it was Jeff Corwin, second time we were with him. Snoop Dogg was there and Snoop Dogg was in the hallway. And when you get there, they're like, you don't talk to anybody. You don't talk to the celebrities. You sit in a little green room and with your animals and don't talk to anyone. I'm like, well, that sucks. I'm going to talk to people. Like, I don't want to just sit, you know, whatever. So I ended up going in the hallway to go to the bathroom and Snoop Dogg is there. Right. And I'm like, yo, yo, yo. And he like looks at me and he gives me like this look. I'm like, Snoop Dogg. Right. And he goes, he like looks at me and goes, yo, cuz you needs to chill. <laughs> and I go, I go, yeah, I go, you want to see some animals? You want to see some animals? Like, that's how I would lo like lure these people in. He's going, what you got, cuz? I said, oh, I got all kinds of good stuff. So then he comes over, he's in the room and he's like looking at, I forgot what we had at the time. I think we had an alligator, a crocodile, a couple other things. We're talking and he's there and his, like his team's there and people are checking out things. And I'm like, he's like, yo, do you mind if I get a picture with the, this and that? I'm like, no. So they're holding it. I'm like, listen, I'll do that, but I want a picture. In your, uh, I want your gold chain on. So I had this giant gold chain around me with like an Uzi on it or a Mac 10. And I'm like throwing up a gang sign. He's like, no, 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 like this. So I'm doing like West Side and all that. And I have an old Polaroid of it somewhere and I love it to death, but it's so faded you could hardly see it. One of the producers took it for me there with a Polaroid. This is before like cell phone cameras. Crazy, I'm old. And um, it was one of the like, one of my awesome moments, you know, like Snoop Dogg hanging out and yeah. And then what happened? I was in the hallway and there was a producer there that was like, uh, come here. I want to talk to you in my office. You know, um, you're not supposed to be in the hallways talking to people and doing this and doing that. I'm like, yeah. He goes, um, you know, you ever get on TV with your animals? And I'm like, yeah, I bring animals for all the celebrity guys and that that want animals. He's like, you ever do it yourself? And I'm like, no. He goes, you should send like a sizzler reel and a headshot and all this stuff to, you know, here because there's somebody taking over for. Conan and he, I go Jimmy Fallon he goes yeah he goes I go oh the guy that you know could never get through Saturday Night Live he's like yeah 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 shut up get a sizzler reel this and that mail it in here I'm like okay so he goes now get out of my office I'm like all right and he goes and stop talking to Snoop Dogg I'm like okay <laughs> so we like leave and thought nothing of it and I got a headshot I threw together like this little DVD reel of like me doing local news stuff and everything and like bringing out this huge alligator snapping turtle for Jeff Corwin. And it looked like I was on the show, but Jeff Corwin was there and I almost plowed him and Conan over. And so we used these little clips and uh, I'll never forget. Jimmy Fallon was like, before he did late night with Jimmy Fallon, he had this wall of all these sticky notes behind him and it said, get animal guy. And I saw that and I start sending out 
DVDs and headshots to Late Night with Jimmy Fallon before it was even Late Night with Jimmy Fallon. And um, July 23rd, 2009, we got a phone call. Twisted Sister canceled. D. Snyder <laughs> lost his voice. I'm not kidding. D. Snyder lost his voice. We would love for you to come on the show. But don't get too excited because you're filler. And I'm like, so it was like, like what? This is crazy. It's like a slap in the face. Like you're filler. Like I don't even know what that means. I'm Google searching filler. Like what does filler mean? Like you know, are they gonna? If someone else better comes along, then I'm just there. And um, we ended up doing it, and uh, it was it was crazy. I was jumping on his furniture with an alligator, and like, you know, my parents were like excited, but my dad's like, "Are you doing drugs? Are you doing drugs? <laughs> like, are you?" I'm like, I was just so amped up. The Roots, dude. That's been my fan since I was a kid. You know, I rocked their tapes until their cassettes popped. I, I like, it's no joke. So. Every time I went on that show, it was, I think, 47 appearances later, I'd walk out and I'd always be like, The Roots, my boys. And they'd all kind of do the same thing because they, I would hang out with them back. And Jimmy's like, You don't even know them. They don't even talk to you backstage. They don't even like you. Uh, and like, we had this little banter, but that, you know, I would hang out with them and, and Black Thought and, and Kamal and, and Questlove gave me this uh, stuff with Al Green and The Roots that never got released that I would listen to. Just like, on, they're just, they're just one of the best bands in hip hop. And uh, they're like, it was just cool. Cause it was like a triple whammy here. I'm on late night TV. I'm hanging out with Jimmy Fallon, these crazy guests. And, you know, at the time, one of my favorite hip hop bands ever, you know, and it was just, it was, it was awesome, you know, and it, and then it just kind of went from there. It like snowballed. And then we just started doing the today show and Steve Harvey. And then I did a guest appearance on Eastbound and down and I Carly and, and, uh, just everything man it's just been one hell of a ride it really has so i'm probably thinking what a lot of other people are thinking which is like weren't you a little bit nervous at any of any point of this have you always just been this person dude i'll tell you what the i never like really sweat right like i was always like you know as a kid my mom's like use deodorant i'm like why and they're like you sweat i'm like i don't sweat like i'd see people wet through their shirt and stuff and i'm like that's so weird like i just don't sweat like i'm a weirdo maybe i'm clogged up or something i go to the doctor when i'm a kid i'm like i don't sweat is that normal He's like that day i was cool as a cucumber and just before i went on jimmy fallon's a touch of class he comes over to everybody's room and talks to them before they come on it he opens the door and he goes hey and i go hey and he goes, you look just like the picture. And I go, yeah. He goes, we have so many headshots of you. We wallpaper the whole eighth floor of Rockefeller, right? So I would just keep sending them and sending them and sending them and sending them every day, all day, like $4.95, mail them, mail them, mail them, like to the point like, and when I saw him, I'd always make these little jokes. And I did so on the show where I'm like, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the worm. And he's like, no, it's the, oh, never mind. You know, I'd always make these little stupid jokes, but he walked out of the room and I'm like, oh shit, I'm bleeding. Oh no, dude. I sweat my armpits, the shirt. <laughs> I was I just like woof. And I I was like, what the hell? Something and I like freaked out. Here I'm going on the national late night show and I'm like, dude, I'm like and my, and my brother's there, he's like, calm down. I'm like, am I bleeding? He's like, you're sweating bad, dude. It's nasty. Like you have deodorant. I'm like, I don't even know what to do. Like, I don't even and, and like I guess I started to like really panic and like in more mentally. Um Cause I was like, I'm going to go on a TV show. What if I trip and fall? What if I trip over the, you know, they want me to pull the alligator out from behind the, the, the couch. What if I fall over the couch? What if the alligator? So I'm like getting myself all worked up and I'm like, dude, this is like insanity. But we ended up, you know, chilling out. My daughter at the time was like, you know, the calm down steps, close your eyes, breathe in three times, count to 10. I did one of those, got some deodorant, changed my clothes. And, um, was ready to rock and roll, man. But I'll never forget it. The one time, a couple times I went on there, I would be more hyped up and hyped up. I just love what I do and I love animals and I love educating. And sometimes it comes off the wrong way. I'm just so excited. I'm like a six year old. And this one episode, they were like amped up and they're like, hey, Carrie King's here, the rock and roll chef. Go down the hall. He's got something for you. And he hands me these sugar pixie sticks. I don't know if you remember them as a kid, you know, all pure yeah. sugar. My brother opens a dressing room door and I'm like, downing two of them and my whole fridge they would stock my fridge with red bull and i'm washing it down with red bull 
I went out there and it was one of the worst, I won't even say what episode it was. You probably can tell by watching it on YouTube, but I was like, eh, even worse than I am now. And I was like, my dad's like, what were you on, cocaine? Did someone give you cocaine? What the hell is wrong with you? You look like a moron. And he like really, it's so next time I went there, I'm like, listen, can I just get some bottled waters and like Sprite maybe, and maybe a Coca-Cola in my fridge, but like no sugar, no, no, I like really had to like tone, tone it down. And it's hard because I'm a very excitable person and I just like being, you know, loud and crazy and obnoxious, I guess what you could say, my wife says sometimes, but um, <laughs> I just like, you know, just getting people excited about stuff and, and getting into it. But yeah, it was, it would, I guess the, my being scared turned into, or nervous turned into like crazy excitement, you know, this is why. Yeah, I guess, I guess kind of your superpower is even if you are nervous, you can direct it in some, in some direction and put the energy in the right place. And yeah, that's kind of what I started to do. I was like, um, I would just kind of switch it, but it was funny because one of the producers there, it was cool because I would go out there and you would do a dress rehearsal without Jimmy. Um, or without Steve Harvey or any of these guys, just one of the producers. And I'd always be out there and like I am with you, just talking nonstop and goofing around and talking to the roots. And I'm like, yo, I'd, I'd rap some lyrics and be like, Questlove, what song is that? You know, and they're like, hey, fo focus, focus. Will you just focus? And I would just be loud and screaming and yelling. And they're like, reel it in. Someone reel him in. Can someone reel him in? can you hold the animal this way or that way? And they're like, what are you going to say? What are your lines from here? And I'm like, I don't know. They don't know. They're like, you don't know what you're going to say. I'm like, I'll give South facts or something, but I'll hold it this way and do whatever. And one of the producers, Rob Crabb, who is a producer now um, of uh, James Cobra, uh, James um, Corden and Corden. Yeah. He's the head producer there. He was a producer for Fallon at the time. And he's like, man, you're Alan Iverson of the animal game. And I was so proud of that. He's like, practice? What are we talking about? Practice? <laughs> We're talking about practice, man. Because I would just go out there and just be like, it would just shoot from the hip. And, it, and we had a good time and we always got good ratings. And, you know, we had a, we just had a blast with it, man. And, and uh, yeah, it's just been awesome. It was, it's been an awesome ride. So animals are obviously unpredictable to a certain degree. Have you ever had an interesting moment or a moment in which you thought it, you may get out of hand as far as a, an animal goes? On the show? Yeah. Or, um, we brought on one of the episodes. 90% um, of those episodes were my animals. I didn't, I didn't get animals. I, I would rent them through my company and I raised them and I knew what they were going to do. And this one time we went with another another uh, educational group and they had awesome animals. They were, they brought some of the best animals ever. And um, they brought a water Buffalo and we walked this thing up the freight elevator down the hallway and on the show. And it was the most insane thing because they're like, Oh, if you want them to stop, just pull the halter and dig your heels into the floor. Well, we're on the floor and this freaking thing's moving and my feet are placed into this floor. And you have, at one point, if you watch on YouTube, you can see this thing's just sliding me like Michael Jackson doing the moonwalk right across the floor. And I was like, without trying to make it look like we were out of control, I flipped it and I'm like, you looked him in the eye, Jimmy. He's like, I didn't look him in the eye. I'm like, you looked him in the eye. So I kind of transferred the tension to that. And I'm like, Lur. he just wants to walk. He doesn't want to be um, in one area. So he wants to walk. And I knew this because I have camels and I had a baby camel that was like that. If I didn't have the animals, I probably would probably but it would have been a disaster and he would have took out the roots and the wall and, and everything. So I just would I walked him in a circle, you know, and then he calmed down and we were all right. And then all of a sudden he wanted to walk again. And this is like a 2000 pound water buffalo. So I'm like, if he wants to move, he's going to move. So I was just turning and walking. I'm like, you looked him in the eye again. And I made a joke out of it. Everyone was laughing and no one really knew that this water buffalo was gonna go like down the hallway and take us all with them, you know? So that was, that was fun. That was, uh, that was a, a, a good time. And then the other time I had a baboon on there, shouts out to my boy, Kevin Keith from uh, Monkey Business Productions up in uh, Napa, California. He's he had the, he's had his baboons on like Rock of Ages and all these movies. And 
he rescued them out of labs. He has their, their lab tattoo on his arm and he raised these things and it's just awesome and have just the best life. And, and, uh, I brought him on and, um, this thing was incredible. But after they walked him into the green room, he decided he wanted to run down the hallway. So he ran down the hallway, turned down the one in the room he thought was the green room. It was another room. Kevin ran after him. People were like, what the heck's going on? Totally like, I was like, I don't even know what to do right now. Kevin ran after him. He pooped and peed on Dr. Oz, who Dr. Oz is across the hall, on his desk. So Kevin gets him back. We walk into my dressing room. He's standing there and we're all hanging out. And Dr. Oz comes over. He knocks on the door. He's like, Musil, Musil. I open the door. I'm like, oh, hey, Dr. Oz. He goes, yeah, yeah. Your monkey shit and pissed all over my desk. Can someone clean it up? I was just like, oh, no problem. Okay, we shut the door. I was like, oh my God, I'm never coming on the show again. Like, this is gonna be like, oh my, and it turned into a big joke and you know, a little behind the scenes thing that uh, that happened. But yeah, he just wanted to run back to get into his crate and he was just all excited, but he ran the wrong way, went down the hallway and then went into the wrong room and it was like, uh-oh, didn't know where he was. And and uh, Kevin got him back and, and brought him back and he was sitting in the green room and, and uh, hanging out. But yeah, that thing is full blown. <laughs> male humadryas baboon like this no joke dude like sitting on the couch in my in my you know um dressing room like we were just like what with a diaper on we were like this is insane but what the uh, hell like, is it like uh bringing in a water buffalo into new york city dude i can tell you so many stories about that too because we brought water <laughs> buffaloes we brought camels that my buddy brought camels. And when we pull up to Rockefeller, there's a place near Rockefeller where you go down into the basement. Well, his his trailer was too high. So we had to get permits through the city to park the trailer on the side of the street in Rockefeller Center. So they're like, okay, I'm like, now we got to walk these things down the basement, get them to the freight elevator and take them up the freight elevator and get them on the, the floor. And we were walking down the street and it was in the morning because you lo unload around 11 or 12 o'clock. So like the Today Show people would be getting out. And I'll never forget this. We were walking and I had my buddy Big Mark in front of us. He's this huge dude, tattoos all over him. Because people in New York City would just stop and bring out their phone and start taking pictures. Like we're walking two 1,800 pound camels down the street in New York City. So people would stop and he's like, move, everybody move. And people would just start moving. Some people wouldn't, but we're walking with these camels to go into the basement. and. Uh, I remember the one door kicked open and the camels like jumped back and looked at them. I'm like, whoa, 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 you know? And I, I said, it's all right, it's all right. I'm petting the camel, I'm like, come on boys. So we start walking, I had one, my buddy had one and Kathy Lee was there with Hoda. And Kathy Lee goes, oh my God, what kind of dog is that, you know? And you hear Hoda or someone go, it's a camel. She goes, are you allowed to have camels in the city? Do you keep them in your apartment? You know, she's like yelling things down the street as we walked them and walked them in the Rockefeller. And she goes, it's not even Christmas time. So we know it's not for the radio, you know, music show thing and Christmas. And um, next morning on Today Show, when it was Kathy Lee and Hoda, they were talking about how they saw Jeff the Animal Guy walking camels down, I think it's 50th or 51st Street or whatever in New York City. So that was crazy. But yeah, that's where it all comes back to. You've got to have solid animals, man. If you had something you're like, oh, yeah, like so many people are like calling me up. They're like, I have these or I have these. I'll bring them. They never came out of your pasture. You never had a halter on them. You're gonna haul them into New York City, walk them down a street, down a thing and on an elevator. Not gonna be fun, you know? Yeah. So you gotta have the right people and the right animals and the things that were desensitized to everything. And and uh, yeah, I mean, I sat on the camel's back and pushed down his hump. I rode on his back to get him underneath um, so he wouldn't rip out the ceiling tiles. So it was pretty, it was pretty wild, but um, yeah, man, it is crazy. And then they, the people at the Water Buffalo had a small enough trailer so they could get into the basement of Rockefeller and they loaded them there, walked them up the ramp, went right onto a freight elevator and brought them upstairs. So it was, uh, it was pretty wild. That's incredible. So you must, <laughs> you must, you must essentially have a farm that you live on. Yeah, pretty much. Um, we got about uh, 67 acres now. Um, I have huge pole barns, um, indoor, outdoor enclosures. Um, I have a incubation, walk-in incubation room for the reptiles, like a 10 by 15 for all the eggs and stuff. 
And then I have an office, a venomous room, a uh, full kitchen, a uh, mammal room. And then we have the camel barn off the back of the other barn, which is for the camels and the llamas and the kangaroos and the emus and the donkeys and the zebus and the goats. Cause you gotta have goats, especially when you have kids, you gotta have goats. So my life, you know? So uh, yeah, we have a big facility. Um, lots of acreage and it's something that you got to have because I can't be in a residential neighborhood and be like, Hey Jim, love the shrubs. Don't mind the, you know, mountain lion walking by and the camels out back eating your shrubs. So you got to kind of be in a, in a residential, you can't, you got to be like in a rural area, I would say more than a, a residential neighborhood. Cause that would not be good, you know? So it's uh yeah, man, it's just a, like my wife says, it's your passion, it's your love, it's your hobby, it's your job. And that's where it gets me in trouble, you know? Yeah, I was going to say, you must be doing animal things 24-7. Do you have people that work seven. That work for you? Um, I did till COVID, you know. Um, we had people, mainly family, um, good friends, stuff like that. And then when COVID hit, it was kind of like, all right, man, I really can't have anyone here. Um, you know, we had some baby ringtail lemurs born. Um, then the other ringtail lemur had babies born and with the primates and stuff and, and people and COVID and, you know, everybody scaring everybody with everything. It was kind of like, listen, we're just going to we're going to hold it down. And my wife does hair for a living. So she lost her job, too. Um, and I was booked to go to Jersey Shore, Minnesota, uh, Massachusetts with the Jeff Animal Guy tour. We do like like uh, 75 minute stage shows and. Um, things like that all over the United States, all those got shut down. All my end of the year school shows got shut down. We were going to go do Kelly Clarkson, Wendy Williams, and Tamara um, shows. All those got canceled. Um, and it's just, you, you know, some people are like reaching out and they're like, can we do a Zoom thing? And I'm like, it's just not the same, you know, but it, to do a Zoom like TV thing, like be on, you know, mm -hmm. Rachel Ray through Zoom. It's just, I don't know. Well, here it is. You know, you're like shoving it in the camera and it's just, I don't know, but it's just this whole COVID thing just really screwed up everything right now. You know? Yeah. So what do you, what do you do from here? I mean, there's a bunch of educators that are in a tough spot right now. Um, I mean, you got animals to feed, you got expenses to take care of. Yeah. Uh, my brother and his boss, which were, the, you know, they were on the job as state trooper. Um, he was working with his, his, his boss and his boss was like, what's your brother going to do? Like I did parties for his kids over the years and stuff. And my brother's like, I don't really know. And I, I don't really know. And I was trying to be optimistic and be like, uh, oh dude, it'll be okay. It's going to pass in a couple of weeks. We'll still do June shows at schools. I'm still going to do my stage shows. And they're kind of like, dude, we're going to start a GoFundMe for you. And I'm like, dude, I'm not, I, that's not me. That's not my style. Like everything my parents raised me with, like, you want something in life you bust your ass to get it. Like no one's going to hand it to you. You work, you know, like all my, I got all my signs everywhere, put in the hours, rise and grind. Like, you know, that, that's just sacrifice. Like that's just how I was raised and what I believe in. And when this hit now, looking back at it, I would kiss their feet because we raised a good amount of money and that got us all the way to August. And if it wasn't for my brother and his, and his boss starting that for us, I would have been screwed screwed because all the stage shows and things we had booked, they were just set about to send us out deposits and things. And they're like, Oh no, COVID's coming. Sorry. We're not sending you any money. And I'm like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Like, I don't know what I would do. And I was like, I'm not selling my animals. They're family. It's like, would you sell your brother, your son, your uncle? Well, some people would probably sell their uncle, but um, like the weird uncle that always wants to like get you in the closet and, and uh, tell you stories or something. Anyway, I think that's um, just, yeah, no, I don't think I had one of those. So that was just, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was channeling my inner uh, Dane Cook from back in the day. Um, <laughs> Uncle Diddles or whatever that skit is. It's so funny. Just get you in the closet and then you're reading games up above like Twister and, and all this stuff. Um, anyway, so yeah, they started to GoFundMe and Thank God it was right before everybody started doing GoFundMes and trying to raise things. But the support was ridiculous. The outpour of people that like, I don't think anybody should have cancer, but especially kids. 
So like St. Jude's and Camp Good Days and uh, Special Times and all these things I did stuff for for years. And they're like, oh, let us get, I'm like, I don't want it. Let us give you something for taxes or whatever. I'm like, I don't want any of that. That's just, I'm just doing this to do it. You know what I mean? Like it, uh, Blue for Ben, a big thing up here with these twin boys and one passed away from cancer. And I went to his house like two days before he passed away. And like his mom had all these pictures of him smiling. I get goosebumps. Um, and like that kind of stuff. Like I just want to give back, you know, and I never want anything out of it. And all these people like reached back and all these people I did stuff for out of the years were like donating and they were doing it anonymously. And what I found out about GoFundMe is like my brother would call me up and be like, dude, do you know so-and-so? They donated. Do you know so-and-so? They donated. This guy donated all anonymously. But the love and support, I cannot thank people enough because it was the only thing that kept us going. It was like really getting to the point where it was like, all right, man, like it all this hit right when my busy season was about to start. So it really got really, really scary, real sketchy. Um, and, uh, you know, so that, that really helped out, which was, which was pretty good. Thank God for that. But, um, now I don't know what we're going to do. We're just going to keep on, uh, one day at a time plugging and, uh, keep going, moving forward. And, um, try to stay positive and try to do some zoom things and you know you're paying me big money for this podcast so that yeah, helps. thank yeah. you for that, that, thank you for that. Yeah. that's right i appreciate that and um yeah man just you know the the good thing is like a lot of my stuff um i really started to get more into the breeding of snakes and reptiles and everything so i had a lot of stuff born this year and i was like I used to just wholesale it all. I did like NRABC Tinley with my wife and kids this past March. I think it was the last one before everything went to hell um, and, or October, October because March never happened. And I sold some stuff there and I was like, wow, man, I was giving this stuff away to people like wholesalers and stuff. And I don't mind doing that, but like there's money to be made in this market, like in, in selling retail and breeding because I breed everything, man. Like uh, you think of it, reptile lies, we breed it. And it's like, I was like, all right, well, I had a lot of stuff born this year. So I'm like, all right, now if I sell some of these, because the reptile market's like exploding right now, uh, the babies of this stuff, that could help get me through to hopefully spring and, and when hopefully things go back to normal, you know? So that's kind of what we, we started doing, you know, just uh, not holding back everything, but I mean, and it's funny because a lot of people for years are like, oh, he just does education. I'm like, man, I like have a sick, crazy reptile collection and breed all this stuff, but it probably ends up in like Petco's and, and uh, Pet Smarts and, you know, someone else has all my stuff on their table at Tinley or Pomona, you know, but yeah, uh, yeah it's just crazy, dude. Crazy, crazy. Do you know about how many animals you produce? What kind of size are we talking? Um. A lot, yeah. a lot. Like it, like I do give you a rundown. Like I do stuff like that I love and I don't care if there's like, I don't, I'll never follow the like hot trend. Like you gotta have these. Like I used to breed blue tongue skinks like crazy. And I'd wholesale them for 55 to $65 a piece. And I was crank, I had like 30 pairs of them or something. And I was just cranking them out. and. You know, we did all that kind of stuff and, and I was just wholesaling stuff. But then I kind of cut back on a lot of things and I, di I didn't want to follow the whole, the trend thing. So like we breed a lot of like albino balls and I know like some people are anti-ball. I, I don't know if you like the ball python thing, but. Um, I shit on them like for fun, but I don't actually yeah, yeah. care. So yeah. I like, I like, I like the albinos. I like the pie balls. I like like banana pies, albino pies. I do those because I love them and they sell. I do all kinds of colubrids, everything from Cal Kings to Pueblin milks to, which is funny because they used to give those things away. And then now I'm like Mexican black Kings. We cranked out like 54 of them or something this year. And I think I wholesaled them out at the time for like 125 bucks a piece or something. I'm like, what? This is insane. Like corn snakes. I was wholesaling for like $55. I'm like, this is nuts. Like I used to give those things away. Maclots pythons. I breed the hell out of Maclots. And for years, nobody wanted them. I remember Robin and Chad at uh, Pro Exotics were like, he's like, how about I send you this order 
and you send them to me just to send them to me. And I'm like, what? He's like, nobody wants those. And I'm like, all right, you know, and it's crazy. But Wilma's, Blackheads, um, Maclots, um, what else? Uh, jungle Carpets, Brettles, uh, Red Children's, Regular Children's, Spotted's, Granite Spotted's. Um, then we do the uh, some clown ball pythons, a lot of you know weird clown stuff. I like the clowns. Um, but yeah, dude, just racks upon racks. And then I just really got into boas two years ago. So we did like the Sonorans and the um, uh, Tarahamara, um, Hog Islands, Doomerals, which were also like before I was selling for like $75. And then this year, people are, that know me, all of a sudden I knew something was up because the wholesalers are like, hey, hey, how many Doomerals you got? Hey, hey, how many Hog Islands you got? I'm like, what the hell is going on? They're like, we'll take everyone you got right now. We'll give you a check right now. Before they even are ready to go. And I'm like, so I go on like Morph Market and I'm like, $700 for a Doomerals ground boa? So, I mean, shouts out to Kevin too from Nerd because I guess he went and put something out about Doomerals ground boas. And next thing you know, it like exploded. And it was like the price went through the roof. So, and all this stuff I just. I believe it's it. also um, importation from Madagascar has shut down. And Is I don't it? think. Yeah, or at least it is going to. I've heard something about that. I don't know details because I'm not into those animals. But I yeah, think yeah. there's and yeah, there's a supply okay. thing going on. That's that's what I I heard too. Because people like were all of a sudden I had like a bunch of standing eye day geckos, which I would put on my table at like Tinley, and those things. I think other vendors bought them from me, like every single one. And um, and I'm like, what? The standing eye went like what? Normally we're taking those with us, you know, and I end up wholesaling them out or. They all went and uh, yeah, it's just crazy, dude. It's just insane. But yeah, I don't know. Then I like tortoises too. So we have Herman's tortoises. I breed the hell out of pancake tortoises. Um, Herman's, marginateds. Um, I got some radiated tortoises, some Eldabras, um, uh, forced and I, um, elongateds. Um, elongated tracks, crosses, every dude. It's just, I'm addicted. I am a, I have a problem. They need like reptile anonymous or something. But yeah, I don't think, I think some people are like, Oh, you probably do education shows. So you probably have a few animals. You having that many animals is so much work. You have to be obsessed with what you're doing. Dude. If you're not, you're never going to make it like 18 hours a day. I, and this is what I think I have problems because I go home. You know, play with my kids, do that kind of stuff, play dad, you know, and then uh, have a good time. And then when I'm laying in bed at night, I'm obsessing about what I'm going to do the next day and like what I'm going to set up and how I'm going to do this. And like recently I just did all my my rock rattlesnakes enclosures. And I did like I started posting stuff like Jeff Animal Guy on Instagram. I'll post these things. But I took all these pictures of like their exhibits and set stuff up in, in my, you know, my King Cobra's exhibit and like, just do like these crazy, th I'm just, I just love it, man. And I feel like if you don't love it, like, that's what I feel like happened with the ball Python thing. A lot of people saw that, saw dollar signs, jumped on it, but then they're like, oh shit, I got to clean snakes. I got to clean water mm -hmm. bowls. I got to like, what? Like, you got to love it, man. You got to, this has to be your everything or you're just not going to make it. You know, you're just, you're, you're not, you're going to be like, all oh, my buddies, you know, how many times my friends would call me up. You want to go to a Sabres game? You want to go to a Bills game? Dude, I would love to. I got about 1200 snakes. I got to clean right now. Like there's, there's no way I'm, I'm cleaning snakes and I go home. I take a shower at the building, go in my house, grab my bags and the head off my wife and kids to Disney, you know, like, and, and before I left, I wanted to make sure everybody was cleaned and everyone was watered. And yeah, it's insane. Oh, the are the kids interested in uh, in the animals at all? You know what's so funny? I, I, like, I forced it. My daughter's 12 and my son is 10. He gave himself his own nickname, Jungle Joey. And Jungle <laughs> Joey was on um, one of the talk shows, Pickler and Ben. He was on there with me on Nashville. That was his TV, TV debut. And it's so funny because my wife got so mad. She's like, he's such a ham. He's such a goofball. And he like clammed up when he was on TV. But... He, he opened up a little bit in the end, but they kind of edited the fun parts out, Matt. But uh, it, he, my daughter, when she was born, I like forced it down her throat. And it was like the, 
the old go Diego go days and stuff. So I was like throwing that down her throat and I'd buy her all the animal stuff. As she got older, she was like, I really like unicorns and zebras, you know? And I'm like, dude, I don't want a zebra. I'll do anything for my daughter, but they're just dicks. Like they, you know, they bite you and kick you. And I've never met many nice zebras. So I'm like, I don't want to, yeah. I'm like, I don't really want to get a zebra. I'd do anything for my daughter. But as she got older, she was kind of like, you know, I really like llamas, so hence our llamas that we have, Cobalt and Peru, which she named. But uh, we have two llamas that she walks around, and that's her thing. And to them, it's just like normal, everyday stuff. But Jungle Joey, he's into it. Like, he's yeah. like, yeah, man. Now he's like 10, so he's starting to be like sports. And I'm trying to like reel him back in. I'm like, sports are cool, but let's listen to sports while we're cleaning snakes, you know, or like you know trying to keep him keep his fire burning but yeah he was here the other day cleaning all the the um the snakes and that and uh shouts out to you those corns i got i appreciate ah, it they're beautiful yeah, of course. he uh he sold some leopard geckos that he bred and he sold the leopard geckos and we were looking for some nice ghost corns and uh that's how i you know i came across you on morph market and all that and grab those up and they're gorgeous they're and they ate like two days after they came in they're solid and that's like his little pet project so he goes through the racks and stuff and and uh you know we have some sugar gliders that are born or hedgehogs that are born and he always wants to take those home and tries to talk my wife into it and he's like you know when i'm 16 i start handling venomous and my wife's like oh no 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 that's not happening i'm like dude i'll get rid of the venomous before you touch the venomous you know so it's it's wild, but I have a special door here. You got to thumbprint it and punch in a code and everything to get in there, and then go through another door into another door. So it's they're not just like on a fish tank on a shelf next to some crested geckos. Like, hey, don't touch those, you know? Right. Um, yeah. So he's into it, which is cool, you know. And then he always like now what he's really bummed is like buffalo. We started getting a lot of like different reptile shows and stuff up here, and now with the whole COVID thing, there's no shows. And that was like his fun thing to do. We wake up and, you know, get to the reptile show. And I know somebody that put it on. So we get in there early and bomb through and like grab stuff, you know, that we don't really need, but you know, he just was into it, you know? So I, I miss those, but yeah, it's cool. It's cool to have a son that's really into it. And it's funny cause he's, yeah. he's kind of messing up in school. I love him to death, but he's like, we're like, dude, you got to buckle down. You know, you got to, he's like, why? Who cares? I'm going to work for you. Who cares? I'm like, no, <laughs> dude, you can't, you can't, man. You gotta, you know, you gotta put it, you know, you gotta put it down. You gotta start doing stuff. We gotta get you going here. He's like math. Only thing you need math for is to count money. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, dude, he's 10, you know, I'm like, dude, I'm like, no, you need math for more than that. But he's like, I'm going to work for you. We'll figure it out. Because by then there'll be an app that'll do it for you. I'm like, oh my God. Like, He's not exactly crazy. wrong. I know. That's what's scary about it. That's what like freaks me out. I'm like, you know, he's right. You know, that's a scary thing. Before I had to handwrite type projects. Now you just talk into a computer and it spits out your whole project. I'm like, man. Sorry. I get kookaburras and parrots screaming. Yeah, no, I've been, I've been hearing that. So, uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they're obnoxious. But, uh. Hopefully it's not too loud on your end. No, no, the the cuckoo bear, I mean, I think it's being well behaved for what I seen those things do. So Oh yeah. He's they get usually super, super crazy. Um, but he just hears my voice, so then they all call or they hear me talking or me get excited and then they all call and go crazy. But yeah, man, it's it's wild. I love it, you know. So it. as far as um what's going on right now, um uh, Darren asked, do you think that TV will start back anytime soon? I don't know. I, I hope, but they're doing it so, especially because see, the biggest hotspots are New York and LA. And New York and LA are both like, you can't go into diners, you can't go here. I mean, you can, but only so many people and all. they're doing stuff without like, and when I do shows, you got to have like the crowd there, like a live crowd and people reactions and the oohs and the ahs and things. So hopefully, but you know, if they had TV studios in Idaho, I think we'd be good. But the fact <laughs> that they're in, you know, New York city and Los Angeles, it's kind of tough, but I hope soon because I miss it. You know, I miss doing those shows and, and bringing the animals out there. You're going to have to go on the uh, saloon tour through Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho, man. 
that's a good idea. That is a good idea. People would love that, you know? That's a Wild West uh, reptile tour. Yeah, I like it. I could ride in on my camel. Oh. Yeah, awesome. It'd be oh, awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so how does that work with arranging, like, tours and stuff around the country? Are you uh, – you have to borrow animals in, in every city? Um, Depending, like – if we're in New York or like uh, New Jersey, you know, you got to get all the permits, you got to get all the paperwork, all the health certificates. And most of the time I got a huge van and I have huge travel crates and they go with us. And like, I had things where my kangaroos are hopping around the hotel room with a diaper on and, and my parrots are out on their parrot stands and the hotel knows we're coming and they're just like, you know, and the, the Promoters are like, please don't let them do too much damage. And I'm telling you, every hotel we've been in and we leave, you would never even know there's animals there. The guy walk mm. out the door for a breeze a little bit. They're in black contractor garbage bags and we're out, you know, and we leave. I'll tell you a great story, though. Funny story. This is a great story. We are in Indiana, I want to say. And I had my alligator with me, Darth Gator, the original Darth Gator. And uh, I, had him, I, I had him now almost god 20 years i've had him since he was little and he's now a monster and he's in a big transport gator box which kind of looks like a coffin you know and the hotel the promoter put us up in in indiana they're like listen there's no hotels that allow animals so you're gonna go in and do this one but don't tell anyone you have animals just load in and load out i'm like what so at night me and my brother are loading everything in we have a separate hotel room for the animals we sleep in the room with adjoining drawers adjoining adjoining doors and we bring in the gator the gators looks like it's in a coffin okay the box i have made for it so we load everything the next morning we're leaving and like everybody's already checked out so we wait you know do the 007 look down the hallways we load the animals out we got this alligator in a big travel box and we got it on a big dolly mover and we roll it down the hallway and now the there's this kid there and he's watching us he's got to be like maybe 18 or so and he's like sweeping the floor by the elevator and he like looks at us and we wheel me and my brother and my dad came along for this my road dogs and uh, we wheel this alligator into the elevator right but before this he's watching us load all these other big boxes and like my spider monkey lift up the cover and she like looks at him she's like <laughs> and drops it he was like you know so we load in the elevator and uh we go back up. We have one last trip. So we grab all the stuff. We load this alligator on. We get the alligator on. And uh, when we, the door is still open and we're hitting the elevator door to go down. And the kid watched us load like three things. By the last time, he's sweeping the floor. But the broom's not even touching the floor. He's just like sweeping the air and like looking at us. And me and my dad, my brother, stand there with this big ass coffin in the elevator. And the kid looks in there and goes, what do y'all got in those boxes? And the elevator door won't shut. And I'm like, come on, dude, shut the elevator door. Get out of here, right? So he looks at my dad. This is, and everyone's like, well, you know, now I know where I get it from. My dad looks at the kid and goes, he goes, hey, he goes, what do y'all do? What do y'all got in those boxes? And we're like Southern Indiana area. Sorry to anyone from Indiana if you don't talk like that, but this kid did. And uh, he goes, what do y'all got in those boxes? And my dad goes, we're magicians. And he goes, you ever see when that they cut the lady in the half with the saw? And he goes, yeah. He goes, well, this one didn't go too well. And the doors go ding. And the door shuts. And we go down and he's staring at us like the steam from his mouth. His face is so close to the window. He's staring at us, loading this into the van. And I'm just like, oh, my God, this kid in Indiana that works at a Best Western or whatever the hell the hotel was they put us up in a La, La Quinta Suites or whatever. It thinks we had a dead body in a coffin that we were hauling out of a hotel room, no? But uh, no, no worries. It was only an eight-foot alligator. But most of the time, if we go, like, I got friends in Texas that have animals, they'll bring the animals. I have friends in California, they'll bring the animals. If it's close, East, East Coast area, we can get there, do it, get back the next day. Um, you know, we'll, we'll use our animals. But anywhere else it's usually I, i'll call up a friend of a friend you know or a friend somebody has they're gonna bring animals and that i know will be good animals and 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 go from there and now with with all this stuff going on i'm sure there's a bigger focus on things you can do digitally are there things that you're going to do on social media or are you going to get more involved in that kind of stuff yeah you know what's crazy is just before the whole COVID thing started we 
everybody's like, you need to do YouTube. You need to do YouTube. Show like a day in the life of and all the crazy stuff that happens. So we shot two videos. And I heard my boy, Danny Boy. Shout out to Danny Boy. He's an unbelievable kid with unbelievable camera stuff. And uh, we shot this little thing of goats in my hallway, running down the hallway, just a little thing we put out there. And it went viral. Like um, Ellen had it on her show. And like they didn't say Jeff Animal Guy, which kind of pissed me off because I'm like, dude, that would have been huge for all the stuff. I heard Ellen's nice. That's weird. Yeah. So she didn't give shouts out. It was like somebody shot it to her. And like, and then I saw it on all these animal websites and all this. So my buddy's like, dude, that went like freaking viral. So let's do a goat video and let's do like a feeding the animals video. So he did like these two YouTube videos. We shot them. Um, we put it out there like YouTube and it was, you know, it's crazy. Like the whole YouTube thing. I'm like, do I want to get involved in it? You know, and but everyone's like, why not, dude? You're not just doing reptiles and talking about like what's hatching and stuff. You you could be like talking about camels one minute, goats the next minute, sloths the next minute, lemurs the next minute, looking at hatchling snakes and baby lizards and geckos. And so I'm like, all right, fine. So we started doing it and then COVID hit and then the camera guys and uh, the sound guy and the people we had, the editor, all these people were like afraid to like do anything. And they're like, oh, I don't want to touch anything that so-and-so touched and I don't want to do this. And I can't be within five feet and, you know, six feet, I, we'd be too close. And so everything kind of got shut down for a little bit, but now we're talking about starting it back up again. Cause it was crazy, like a thousand like 1200 subscribers, like within like two days or something. So we started doing that and then we were going to do some merch and stuff like, uh, the old Jesus is my homeboy shirt, but a picture like this dude did this cartoon picture of me with all these animals, kind of Ace Ventura is. And I was going to make some shirts that say Jeff animal guys, my homeboy and, uh, try to like, you know, dudes would like it. I think, you know, so, uh, do some like funny t-shirts and, and some merch stuff and, you know, just put it out there. Cause it's, I think it would be fun. And we got a guy that's doing it. He's a good camera dude. And, uh, you know, keep an eye out for that on YouTube. Jeff the Animal Guy, I think that's ready up. Just go subscribe, like, all that fun stuff. And watch for something new that will be coming out soon. Because with the fall and winter, I got a feeling like a lot of people are going to be sitting around watching YouTube. So I might mm -hmm. as well give them some good content, you know? Listen, I haven't even been putting out videos. And the amount of views has gone up like 50% without me doing anything. Which that's the awesome. algorithm doesn't like when you don't do anything. So imagine if I was doing shit people would actually care yeah so, that's awesome, everyone go man. do it yeah that's awesome like I, I you know it's it's just hard you know because i'm like i get into it i'm like yeah i don't want to do this i just want to clean snakes i mean it sounds stupid but like most people are like i don't want to clean the snakes but i just want to i don't want to have to like do the shooting and doing this and doing that and then i feel like why not i have it all you know do it up i feel like that's the future man youtube's it you know, what I mean, I feel like almost in a way TV and stuff is going to go the way of the dinosaurs. Unfortunately, I feel like YouTube and Netflix and a lot of that kind of stuff is like where it's at. You know, I just think YouTube is going to explode even more and because you can watch what you want to watch. Like my kids make fun of me, but like the one night I'm punching up like um, like uh, radiated tortoises or some breeding radiated tortoises or something. Boom, there's a video and someone's showing and my kids are making fun of me and like they're like you know my wife's like i never have to worry about jeff with porn because it's just like bearded dragons bearded dragons.com you know or like my brother everyone like teases me makes fun of me. i'm just i'm addicted man i just love it i love all reptiles i love all animals and you know youtube you just punch something up boom you can watch it you know so it's uh it's the it's the future for sure for sure. All I can see is the title man lives with, you know, camel and monkeys <laughs> and all this other stuff. Come on, man. That's like a hundred thousand views immediately. I'm telling you, that's what I mean. Then you got to do all the clickbait stuff, you know? Oh yeah. You got to go get bit by stuff and whatever. Yeah, yeah. Stuff down by a camel or, you know, God craziness. But yeah, dude, that's where it's at. We're definitely going to come, we're going to hit that pretty hard and then do all the merchandise and, and uh you know sell some funny shirts and some cool stuff and you know go from there Try to yeah so i it. guess this is it's kind of like at this point we're forced to adjust in some form or fashion and yeah. that's certainly something in which you can you can make happen during this whole thing yeah that's what i mean man it's like especially if like right now 
you know, I'm in New York. So like Governor Cuomo is shutting down Halloween, man. He's like, no Halloween, this, that. They're saying all this stuff. So I'm like, well, there goes all my Halloween shows. And then like, what about all the corporate Christmas parties and everything I do? That probably won't happen. So I'm like, we got to do something. So keep the animals fed. I start doing like cameo. That's super fun. Cameos. Shout out to cameo. That's like, that's a blast. But people make you say like weird stuff. Some of the stuff I won't do. But like some stuff, people will watch my cameos and they're like, what did you say? Like what? Like I'm just like making people are like, okay, you know, like say, give a shout out to my son and have a cute animal there and tell him now he's six. You we're no longer wiping his butt. So I'm like, what? But I'm like, all right, I'll say it <laughs> and make fun, have a good time with it. So we're doing tons of cameos. Dude, I broke up with somebody that had a girlfriend of six years I did <laughs> on cameo. Like, it's crazy. Like, I make these things on Instagram. I'm like, I'll talk to your mother in law. Dude, I topped that. Like, I broke up with a guy. I'm like, hey, whatever, Jane, whatever her name was, Tony doesn't want to be with you anymore. Here's a monkey. Anyway, he said, you know, this and that, and, uh, you know, and I'm sorry, but, you know, he moved on. They, and I have a camel or something. He's like, and he's moving on to greener pastures, just like Tony is. And I'm like, I can't believe I did it, but I was like, I don't, I guess I'll just do it. Like, this is, I'm doing stuff for gamers instead. Like, dude, it's, it was just crazy. But any hustle, man, anything to keep my family fed, you know, keep everything going. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, <laughs> like, uh, Dude, yeah, so the, fun. the amount of uh, I follow a few podcasts who usually the running joke is they get certain celebrities to say certain things on cameo. So like they lit there's people out there trying to get you to say weird things for sure. Dude, I did this one. They're like, she's like, my brother always says Scooby Doo and pull my finger. So I'm like, hey, it's Scooby Doo and pull my finger. And like, and my wife was like in my facility at the time in the hallway where I shoot it with like the backdrop and that. And she's like, what the hell did you just say? I'm like, I don't know, man. That's what these people told me to say. So I said it, you know? And she's like, that was stupid. Like, just don't do that. I'm like, why not? I didn't say anything yeah. bad. You know, I didn't swear or like make fun of anyone really. Like some people I make fun of, but they want me to make fun of them. So I do it. But um, and they're like, please say this and make fun of this and that. But I try to do it like fun, you know, without like really insulting anyone. Some lady guy was like, oh, make fun of my wife. She used to be a raver. So I did this one and I flashed the lights on and off. I'm like, oh, sorry. I thought I was at a rave. Ask your mom about that. You know, like just crazy stuff. But it's, yeah, man, it's it's fun. But some of these things come in and you have like four days to do them or something, five days to do them. And some of them will come in and I'm like, I'm not doing that. Like, I'm not saying that. I'm not, I could easily do it. And, they'll, you know, put the money in your account type thing, keep going. But I'm like, I'll do a lot for my animals, but some of these things that they want me to say or do, or I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm like, we'll let that one go, you know? So. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely a cool platform for, I mean, you see all types of people on there and uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, anyone it's, to break up with anyone. Yeah. There call me a Jeff animal, Jeff, <laughs> the animal guy on cameo, dude, I'll break up with your girlfriend. I'll talk to your mother-in-law. Dude, I'll do whatever you want. We always have an animal in there. The one time I was talking and the camels were like eating and dropping hay on me. And, you know, the other time I was like, you know, somebody's, it was in my aunt's pool with my alligator and just whatever. Just try to make them funny so people get them and they're like, what the hell? You know, so it's funny. But, so what, yeah. what percentage, I mean, you must have a certain part of you that loves performing as much as you do animals or what's kind of the balance there? Um, half and half, I guess you could say. I mean, like I, my whole thing was when my dad made that comment to me years ago, like, oh, you can be like a clown with animals, you know, I started a company in Nickel City Reptiles and Exotics, and I was like educational entertainment. If you're not laughing, you're not learning. And I did it like in a fun way. So it's like I was performing like stand up comedy, but with animals. You know, so I would do something fun. I would do something, try to make people laugh. But it, if you're not laughing, you're not learning is like my little stick and make people laugh. But then they're kind of like, oh, shit, like I, I really learned something right there, you know, or like, um, you know, I'm like, oh, King could you, you know, they got like a 12 inch tongue. We should have named him Gene Simmons. And everyone laughs because he's got a big tongue. But like they're going to remember a King could you has a big tongue because of 
Gene Simmons from Kiss and like just like fun ways of like doing stuff and making people, you know, get educated while they're having a good time. But I love it both, man. I love the entertaining part of it and, and the educational part of it. And I, I love the animals, you know, I just, I love it all. I love it all. So have you been able to do um, any shows since then? Have you done any online or yeah, I know you said it's not the same, but dude, we did one. I, I got to figure out, I'm not the most tech savvy. Now we're trying to figure it out and start doing zooms. Like all we started getting calls now, start doing zoom stuff for like corporate meetings and stuff all over with different animals, all over the United States. We're starting to get these calls, which is awesome. And it's a blessing, but we did one and I didn't know what the hell to do with zoom. And it was like 25 kids and parents on a Zoom. And they're like, what is that? Huh? I can't stand. Everyone's like yelling things and do it. I didn't know what anxiety was until this. I told my wife, I'm like, dude, I got up. I, I, I was like, all right, thank you guys so much. I shut the camera down and I went outside and I'm like, I'm having heart palpitations. Like, bup, 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 bup. she's like, that's anxiety. I'm like, dude. I'm like stressed out over this. Like all these people yelling. So what is that? Oh my God. Is that what? And like, yeah. And all this going on where normally I'm doing a stage show. People are watching, laughing, learning. I do some questions at the end, but people are just yelling stuff at me during it. And they're like, we can't see it. And this monkey's like grabbing the computer. And it was a nightmare. Like that was the first one we did. And I was like, never again. I'm never doing zoom. I'm never going on anything. And my buddy goes, dude, you just have them all silence things and do this and do, I'm like, no one ever told me that. Like, I didn't know, like everyone's screaming and yelling and camera things are flashing. All these squares are flashing. I'm like, I, what the hell? Why didn't anyone ever tell me that? And my buddy who's a tech guy is like, well, you never asked. You just said you're doing zoom. I figured you know what you're doing. Oh man. That was a nightmare. That was that was such a nightmare that I didn't even want to promote. I was doing Zoom for like two months. I was like, I, I had, I couldn't sleep at night over that. Like I, <laughs> I would just sit in the corner and shake. It was so bad. People are like, what is that in the background? I'm like, what? They're like, did something get out? And they're like yelling things. And like, I'm like, no, what are you talking about? And they're like, never mind. It was my dog or what? And I'm like, I can't do this. I, I can't do this. I can't do this. Well, let me know if you ever need if you ever need help with that because it's uh, we did a little bit of a show via like Streamyard like this, and you can kind of put people, you can take people in and out of your stream. Like if someone had a question, they could raise their hand. Yeah. You could stream in if you wanted to or something like that, and you can stream See, live on YouTube private. And, dude, like that's what I mean. You're like a technological genius. Like you can do well, all that. Me, me, that. me, I just got things flashing and people screaming <laughs> at me, and I was like, ah, like. And I'm already amped up and over caffeinated. And then I'm like, these people are all yelling at me. And then I got one dad's in the background like this, staring like this. And he's like, this isn't very educational. This isn't very educational. And kids are screaming at me. And I'm like, I can't say anything educational because I don't even know what's going on or what people are seeing. And <laughs> oh, dude, it was, it was something. That was something. Like, I'm not used to that kind of stuff. And again, it goes back to like me not wanting to bring a ferret and a chinchilla to an educational program because I'm cheating someone. I feel like you're doing an educational program, but you gotta evolve. You gotta do what you gotta do right now. But I feel like I'm cheating people with them seeing the animal through the camera, not so much like in right there with you. You know what I mean? To see them and feel them and smell them. And But I've also seen pretty cool things where I did a, this big corporate event that we did a zoom for and then we did it we shot it at their place and they had a camera crew and all that because they're a big corporate event and i went to their place to shoot it and they did all the stuff with the camera and i got real close and you got to see uh -huh. like a dwarf came and like right there and its teeth and all that. and people were like dming me and all that like this was amazing we've seen your shows for years and it was so cool the monkey like was touching the camera and right up in the can so that was kind of cool and that's what made me start thinking like i could probably do this like if i yeah. figured out all the you know, ins and outs of stuff. I think we could, you know, make it kind of cool to get us, get us by till we get back to normalcy again, you know? Yeah. I think that the biggest pack, the biggest feedback that I got from our event is that there was no crowd interaction. It's different when you take out an animal and there's like not much feedback and yeah, like yeah. kids aren't like, <gasps> yeah, the oohs and the ahs and the, yeah, that's the best part, man. That's that right there. tells you too. Like I do that 
when I'll get an animal for a show or something, or like my buddy has something, I'm like, let me borrow that for a little while. You know, let me try using them for shows and I'll bring them out. And if you don't get like forever, I wanted the huge Suriname toads forever, but they would come in low, so loaded with ticks and stuff. And it was just so much a headache, but I have these giant African bullfrogs. So I borrowed my buddy's toad for a while and I bring it out and people are like, Ooh, ah, and I'm like, wow, so I'm not really getting that big of a reaction. But you bring out a giant African bullfrog and people are like, whoa, everyone's like always, oh, my God, you know, it's like size of a dinner plate. So I was like, all right, that saved me right there. I don't have to worry about getting the imported toads now because why bother if you got a frog that people love? But, yeah, that's kind of how I judge the animals, too, with like the reaction you get from the crowd. So that would be hard to not to get reaction stuff when you bring things out. You know, I love that, too, like people getting excited about the stuff you know yeah so there's uh there's someone in the chat here art and craft that's actually uh watching from kuwait and they were wondering awesome. what your what your favorite animal is oh man that's a good question but it changes every day um see and then we got to break it down in groups like this is gonna get oh ugly. yeah i don't even yeah. know if you got enough time we could go for hours um groups i love all animals but favorite like bug i would say arachnid type thing i would say emperor scorpion just the best you use the black light on them they turn green the kids freak out the best birds i would say eurasian eagle owl i have two of them i love my eight eurasian eagle owls favorite bird on the planet six foot wingspan just awesome uh reptile that's a tough one because i would say top three i would say alligators one of my favorite ever shouts out to violent gentleman making the uh, alligator shirt love it love those dudes hooking me up um alligators number one um number two i would say king cobra um and uh number three i would say the shingleback skink but that uh, those are my top three reptiles and then mammals that also changes a lot but i would have to go top three which would be um camels which I would be number three. I love my camels. Uh, I would say spider monkey. And then I would say top one is my binturongs. I got a binturong or a bear cat. And that's like oh. one of my favorite, favorite animals. One of my videos on Instagram, I'm like, I'll put out the stories where I'm like playing with them and wrestling with them and stuff. We raised him up from, I mean, he, he was no bigger than a, you know, a pop bottle. I mean, this thing was so little. Mom did, first time mom didn't want to raise him. She ate like a couple of the brothers and sisters. So they pulled them, got them on a bottle, friend of mine, Zoo. And I'm like, I'll hand raise them. And we did. And I fell in love with him. And I'm like, what do I got to do to keep him? You know? So we worked something out. But yeah, he's Rocco, man. He's the best. That's one of my favorite animals. So Southeast Asian bear cat or Bintrong. As a reptile guy, all this stuff is very foreign to me and how the industry works with mammals and all of these crazy animals i mean how do you acquire an animal like that um most of the time we i'll hang in there like the whole like you hear all this stuff like they rip them from their mothers and they did most of my animals came from animals that mom didn't want to raise and what i say in the mammal world is the biggest thing that people are always like they take them from their moms dude if i have an animal like my lemurs have babies you bet your ass I want the mother to raise him. I don't want to raise that thing. I raised the one. I fed him every hour on the hour with a syringe, with Infamil. And, you know, like, I loved it. Don't get me wrong. But if mom's doing her job, let her do her job. But in captivity, this is where animals, I think, are smarter than what people give them the, the benefit of the doubt the, or, or give them credit for. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, that's a bad mom. She didn't want to raise her baby. Bullshit. That's an animal that's so smart because they look at it like we're getting food, we're getting everything taken care of. And you know what? If I leave this kid here, they're going to come in and raise that thing for me. I'm good. You know, it's like your neighbor, dude, puts a baby out on a, in a, in a little um, car set on your porch. You know what I mean? And they're like, well, they know someone's going to raise it. You know, I wouldn't do that with a kid. That's terrible. But um, I'm sure people have. But like with an animal, like they put them down, like my spider monkey. The mother left it on the shelf, went over, played with it for a little bit, didn't know what to do. It was a first time mom left it there. My friend called me. He's like, hey, we got a baby spider monkey. We're bottle feeding it. We're going to make sure everything's okay. But do you want to raise a spider monkey? Do you want a spider monkey? And I'm like, 
Sure. So we raised her up. We have Coco. She, I do a lot of Instagram stuff with her too. She was raised from a baby. I mean, she was that big and went down to Texas. We got her from a friend of mine down there. He's got a small zoo and they had a baby spider monkey born at the time. They had a bunch of other stuff they were raising and it's a lot of work, but you got to love what you do or it's not going to work. So, you know, I get these things from the parents that don't want to raise them. And then, and then we raise them, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, that's the biggest misconception. I think with a lot of people are like, Oh, they rip them from their moms. I'm like, dude, my kangaroos, we have babies we use for educational shows. The moms actually kick them out of the pouch. They're like, see you later, go to college. Bye-bye. And then we offer them a pouch and some, um, Wambaroo milk. They hop in there. I use them for my programs. I'll put them back in the enclosures and they'll live with the moms. They'll go over and yank the pouch down and drink some of her milk. They, they're raised and live with the kangaroos. Unless we have a mom, like we have a couple moms that'll toss the babies and then they got to be hand raised and they're in a pouch and they're hanging from my pantry door in my kitchen and getting licked by the dogs and hanging out with the kids and getting used to all the noises and, and, you know, they'll, they'll stay with us forever. But, um, a lot of times we let, you know, it, the moms do a good job, but a, a lot of times the animals are, I think, smarter than what people give them credit for. And just kind of like, you know what, I don't need to do this. I can leave this baby here and they'll take care of it for me, you know? Right. So are there any animals that kind of like don't make the cut as far as uh, trying to tame them down to a point where you could make them an educational animals? Hyenas. So do you, do you have hyenas? <laughs> I learned that lesson. I still have all my fingers. Thank God. Uh, that finger is a little crooked. As you can see, that's from a striped oh, yeah. hyena. That's from a striped hyena that grabbed a hold of me many, many years ago. That one was the mother didn't raise it. And then a guy had it for a while. And then he was like, oh, you know, I don't have experience with carnivores. I'll let you raise it. And this thing busted out of a crate at Delta and was running around the office <laughs> screaming. Then we, they called me to go get it. I got it. We got it back. We had it here. And I had it in the basement of my house because I was like, dude, I'm not going to be able to handle this thing for education. So it's going to a friend of mine who has a zoo in San Diego. So it's going to go out there tomorrow. Well, Delta canceled a couple of flights. So we had this thing home with us and it was in a big, like five foot by five foot by 10 foot uh, enclosure in my basement with like blankets and all that. We were trying to bottle feed this thing and it was, it would just growl in the middle of the night and sound like Satan was coming through the floor. It was like, Rah! dude, it was insane. I was like, dude, there's no need for that. There's no need to have one. I thought like, oh, I'll bottle raise it. I'll be the only person on, you know, I'll bring a hyena on a late night program and have a hyena that walks on a leash. And no, dude, they're hyenas for a reason. Like they, there's no one working them in the educational reason, in the wor educational world for a reason. Like, they're hyenas. So it's, uh, yeah, dude, they're, they're sketchy, sketchy, sketchy animals. You know, then we tried the spotted hyenas because I had a friend of mine that had some spotted hyenas and mom had them and she was at a, a zoo in New Jersey at the time. And they were like, mom was dragging them around, not doing anything with them. So they pulled them and got them on a bottle and raised them. And they were like, oh, you can use one bottle, raise it, use it for educational things and stuff. And then when it gets bigger, we'll bring it back and it'll go to a friend of our zoo in Maryland or wherever. And I was like, OK. And I went down there and I couldn't even get near this thing. And it was this big, a little brown hyena cub but the thing the, the noises are different than any animal i've ever heard normally i can read animals but there i always tell people there's two animals that i cannot read no matter what one is hyenas and the noises that come out of them i just cannot read them and tell what they're going to do the other is bears bears there's if you're a bear trainer you train bears like doug seuss the guy that does all just the grizzly bears grizzlies bear you've got to be a bear trainer. They give you no signs. They give you no nothing. They're just like, they're, if you read bears and work with bears, that's what you work with. Cause they're badass, and they're, they, you cannot read them. It's, I, I tried many times with people I know that have bear, black bears and grizzlies and stuff. And it's, they're so tough, man, to, to read They're So that's another one. They, they, they just sketch you out one minute. They're fine. Next minute, they just whoo, take a swipe. You know, I just, woof, I'm good. I'm good. You remember, uh, you remember Grizzly Man? You ever watched yes. that? Yes. That dude, what, what was his name? Patrick? Tim, Timothy Patrick? Timothy? Timothy? Bear oh, bait. I don't know. Yeah, dude. Oh, yeah. That guy. 
that was some crazy stuff. Like, I want to go sleep with them. Or, like, what are you doing, man? Yeah, like, he basically he lived uh, with the Bears, right, for yeah, probably years. Yeah, and he'd pop up, and they were like, he'd be over there when they're eating salmon and eating berries, and he's, like, taking selfies before selfies were a thing in, uh, with these bears in the woods. And I'm like, dude, man, like, there's another big rule in life. Like, you don't go near a mom bear with babies. You don't do that ever ever and uh there's been some other videos popping up on youtube and social media lately with the one guy going near the bear and he almost got ass kicked with that mother bear mm -hmm. trying to get near the babies like they will do anything to protect those cubs and uh yeah dude you don't mess around and this dude's like taking video selfies and oh that was just like crazy absolutely crazy you know have you had any sketchy moments with any animals? I mean, besides the hyena messing up your finger? Um, sketchy moments. I, uh, God, yeah, I've had a lot of sketchy moments, dude. I had, uh, I removed a cobra out of, uh, see, a br uh, my brother-in-law is a buffalo cop. And then I have other friends that are cops and, and SWAT teams and, and drug enforcement and stuff. So, They'll call me because they'll be like an alligator in some guy's basement. And they're like, dude, it's eight feet. And they're going to put a bullet in it. I'm like, fuck that. Like, you're not putting a bullet in anything. You know, they already had a, a shitty start to life. I'll get them, get them up and going. And I'll place them at, you know, alligator farm or a zoo. Or I'll get them somewhere before you put a bullet in them. So I'll go on these calls and I'll get stuff. And um, it's like 2.30 in the morning. And then my wife's yelling at me. She's like, you're not even on their health insurance. You're going to go get cobras out of someone's house. And this guy's calling it a spitting cobra. And uh, it's hitting a screen of a 75-gallon fish tank. And its fangs are hitting the top. And it's spraying venom. Mm -hmm. It's not a spitting cobra. But it's the way its fangs are hitting, it's spraying. So I show up there. And I got my um, shout-out to DanaTongs.com. That's my boy, um, Midwest Tongs. That dude's just the best. He's given me so many cool things and awesome products over the years. And um, I got my whole like shotgun case of uh, tools and I get there and I'm like open the top and it's got like stickers on it that say I bite and there's so many feces in this enclosure. They never, they got a Cobra probably at like a Hamburg show and put them in a 75 and never touched them again, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was just disgusting. And um, I got my box, my box that it goes in inside another locked box and I got everything sprayed down with like Preventamite and everything. Cause I just don't want them traveling anywhere. God knows. And uh, I put everything in there and I open the thing and this thing shoots out. And I hook him up and he's like over my head on a hook and grabbers. And these cops are all standing there and the guys got their hands on the guns and that. And I'm like, don't shoot anything, you know? And I, I hook him up and I tail him and I bring him down and get him in the box and he's all good. And I get him home and I'm in, you know, I got a separate facility that I keep the stuff in all locks and double locks and everything before that anything goes into my facility, make sure everything's, you know, quarantined and okay. And this thing had mouth rot. I mean, of course it is living in its own filth for years. And um, so I go and swab its mouth out because I'm like, I don't want anything to suffer because people being idiots and things. And so I pin them down, you know, grab them by the back and get the betadine I'm swabbing out its mouth. And this thing turns, boom, bit me right on my thumb. And I drop this thing and I grab it with tongs and I put it back in a crate. And I'm here. I got bit by a cobra, and I'm worried that snake's gonna get out or something. You know what I mean? And I'm no one's gonna be able to find a snake or you know whatever. So I, I you know, I'm gonna die here, and there's gonna be a loose snake. And I, I, my mind's going a mile a minute. I get him up. I get him in the box. I lock the box up and everything. And I had the anti venom. Um, so I got the anti venom, and I'm all ready to like go to the hospital. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, I'm not feeling anything. I'm feeling like the effects, like I'm going to pass out because I'm so like worked up from it that, you know, I'm, I'm going like this and I'm squeezing my thumb and I'm squeezing my thumb and I'm looking and I'm squeezing my thumb and nothing's really happening. I'm not feeling any effects and the hole's not opening up and, and uh, going through my protocols of everything that's going to happen. And I mean, by rights, I probably should have ran to the hospital, but I was just kind of like, dude, I gotta, I gotta see what's going on with this. I also noticed that the back of its head always looked weird. So long story short, I feel like it was a dry bite from a venomoid because the guy, when I was getting the snake out of the thing, 
there was some guy that used to sell Venomoid snakes. I forgot what the name of him was, but at the time he had a sticker on the tank. And I remember seeing that. I was like, I wonder if this thing's a Venomoid. And it didn't have the really big, huge head on him. It kind of had a sunken head. The venom glands were removed. So that was a close call. I thought it was just because it was malnourished. But knock on wood, again, that was like a either a dry bite from a very sick cobra or it was a Venomoid because we never, you know, tried to see if he was or anything after that. But that was a really sketchy, scary time. The only time I would ever say that I got bit. And then, you know, I'm sitting here like I'm trying to save this cobra's life and, you know, swab it out its mouth three, four times a day with Benadine, Iodine, Novasan. And, and here I am like going to die over, you know, I wouldn't die, but go to the hospital and, and just millions of dollars in vet bill and, and health bills and all this stuff because I'm trying to save this stuff. And that's when my vet and everybody's kind of like, you know what? You, you can't play God. You can't save everything. You can't play God. You can't, you know. So I had to kind of, that was 10 years ago. I had to kind of take a step back and I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. I don't, every now and then if I go to dinner with my wife, I'll have a nice glass of wine or something, but I'm not like a heavy drinker or anything like that. So I'm always focused when I'm messing with my stuff. I don't, I don't deal with my hots on the holidays when, you know, the emergency room is going to be packed with stuff or there'll be no doctors on call. I just handle, you know, I, I deal with them at a certain time of day. I just follow a protocol with everything. I'm not, I'm not afraid to use tools. I'm not afraid to have shifter cages, that kind of stuff. But I learned a lesson from that, that it was kind of like, if that happens again, and there's something medically wrong, I'll find somebody that wants to swab out of Cobra's mouth. I just can't, for my family, my kids, my, I can't take that kind of chance, you know? Absolutely. So, so yeah. I mean, obviously you have a, you have a room full of venomous snakes though, as far as like yeah. working day to day with the animals. I mean, you're rather comfortable with them and that hasn't happened in your home. Like uh, no, close never. Thing, yeah. no, no, they're not my home. Cause I'd be divorced. Like that would be, that would <laughs> never ever, that would be like, you know, they're in a room inside a room inside another room through two doors yeah. to get in and everything's sealed off, you know, all vision cages. And, but I have a, like a lot of shift boxes for things. So like the Cobras and that they're always pretty much hiding. So I just lock the shift box. I shut that, I go in there, clean it, or I shift them to one side. Um, I use tools for everything, you know, um, I don't take chances. I don't reach in to snag that water bowl real quick to fill it with water. Doesn't happen. A tool's coming, grab it out, or the snake is removed or locked in a lock box before I go in. And I think knock on wood, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I've been dealing venomous, de not dealing them, I don't deal them, but I have them, I've been dealing with them for 25 years and I've never been bit. And I heard people usually when bites happen is like people are intoxicated or you're holding the snake up or you're messing the snake or you're pinning them behind the head and all that kind of stuff. And after that happened, I'm like, dude, keep everything clean, keep everything healthy, use tools, don't take chances, you know? And, uh, and that's, that's what I do. I don't, you know, drink a few beers and be like, Hey dude, you want to see a rattlesnake? Like, no, hell no, that ain't happening. You know? Um, and, and most of the people I know in my life haven't even seen my venomous collection. You know, it's, you know, it's just kind of, it's not something that I bring people in. You want to see a cobra? Like, it's just not, you know, I have a, a, a zoo, zoo built display trailer that I have that I do like venomous snakes of the world, like display at like different fairs and festivals and things like that. So we, we use them for that um, display kind of thing, but they're behind glass, behind glass, behind locked enclosures and the whole nine yards. Um, and we won awards and stuff at different festivals and fairs with that trailer, which is pretty awesome. But uh, that's mainly what it's for. And, you know, that's, that's what we have them for. And I just love them, but uh, I just don't take chances with them, you know? And I know there's people out there that are going to be like, you have venomous, you're going to get bit, blah, 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 blah. I get it. But I know a lot of people that have done and have taught me and mentored me over the years with venomous that have handled things the way I do. And they haven't been, you know, I just learned a loss in that time to, you know, you don't, there's no need to grab them. There's no need to like, I know some of these people, they're like, you tube them and you probe them. And yeah, I don't need to know because I'm not breeding them. So I don't need to probe them. I don't need to tube them. If there's a medical issue. I'll find somebody I know. And, uh, you know, we'll take care of it. It has to be taken care of, but I don't, you know, I don't do any of the, let's get them out and get them hooded up and, you know, the kind of stuff. 
Well, you'll you'll never make it on YouTube. No, I you know. got it. That's what I mean. You got it. That's what I heard. You got to get out the venomous stuff that's going to kill you and play with it in a room and yeah, maybe. Make, make sure you're in a small space where you can't get away. Yeah. Right, like, exactly. That always works out great too. You know, in a room with tanks of venomous snakes everywhere. So if you run and knock them over, you're knocking over other venomous <laughs> stuff. You know? Yeah, dude, imagine, I can't. Yeah. I can't. I can't, you know, like some stuff I'll get out for educational stuff. Like if I did, like I did a zoom thing for a, a fire department and I did some stuff, the one that zoom that actually went really well. And I got out like my albino Western diamondback and a neat big Eastern diamondback and a gaboon viper I talked about different venomous snakes and they were on like a table and I had them like that. And that was cool. You know what I mean? But I didn't have anyone in the room watching. I had, a, you know, like the guy with the video camera across the room set up and he was like hiding out in the kitchen. Um, <laughs> it was his head around the corner, but uh, no, it was, you know, we do things like that, but uh, you know, as far as like just playing with them and stuff, I don't, I don't mess around with that. Uh, you were talking about earlier about setting up different enclosures for, for your rock rattlesnakes. Is that something that you're into? I mean, it seems like more of the reptile hobby is all into making uh enclosures these days bioactive naturalistic stuff is that something you're getting into yeah i have a lot of like um oh no we lost you for a second in my house i have like uh the only animals i have in my house are my kids really and my dogs <laughs> and then um i got into like dart frogs like real heavy for a while like crazy and next thing you know i had like i would put stuff on instagram like homesick today built a vivarium like crazy like i would just do i had probably 14 living vivariums in my house my parents would come over from like kids birthday parties my family my brother and that and they're like dude your house is like a zoo like a museum like this is these are awesome can i have one of these but then when you tell them they gotta eat the fruit flies and that everybody's like oh okay never mind you know um they don't want to do that but like all the living plants and stuff and then it was a couple summers ago when it was really hard to get fruit flies and the heat was killing everything and I kind of you started like losing some frogs here and there, and then the fr couldn't get food in from them because there was fruit fly problems. And then I was raising my own fruit flies, and then it just got out of control. So I was like, you know what? I had friends. I had like a children's hospital that wanted a frog display, and the one doctor had them at home, so I donated one to him and donated one to another guy I know at a school that had it in their lobby that you know was a science teacher. And now I just have like an emerald tree boa and uh um fly river turtle at my house you know that are just dis displayed really killer you know and just like museum quality like setups but a lot of the stuff like i do the rock rattlesnakes with the rocks and the stone and the you know the pine needles i order on amazon and set that all up in pine cones and some of the pictures on instagram too you can see like my eastern diamond back i got like a shed antler there with like a pine cone some pine stuff so it looks like the you know where you'd find them in florida you know with ferns and everything the, and i got like the zoom med wood backgrounds and stuff and i got like the rock backgrounds and so i set it up so it's like beautiful but also so that you can see kind of know where they are not too crazy like where you won't see them or know where they are you know right. but yeah I, I really like to decorate things up like i have a lot of agurnia species a lot of skinks a lot of like uh, cunningham and gigi skinks and um depressa and um hosmarai 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 um and they're all set up with the rocks and i, I mean you look like you took a chunk of australia and put it in a you know six foot enclosure like in my reptile room so things like that that you know they're not going to destroy them and they'll do good and you get baby the worst part is you got to rip it all apart when you're like trying to get babies and stuff you know when they're before dad tries eating all the males and stuff and they're getting too old in there but i'd let them live in family groups and the, the african zebra skinks and it just i have so much i love i love the like living vibranium i always loved it because i feel like they did a lot of it in europe it was like big in europe first so I'd follow a lot of like European, like venomous people and European, like gecko people and see these vibariums. And I always wanted to, to do it. And then when I saw more and more of it popping up, like you go to shows and people are selling the, like my wife would make fun of me forever. I buying bags of leaves and stuff. And she's like, what are you doing? Like, who yep, does me. that? You know? Yeah. I just <laughs> love that. You know, I just love that. But yeah, yeah I love the living vibrarium stuff. I think something that I really underestimated, like 
as far as reptile keeping goes is now I'm getting into geckos and different micro geckos. And the fact yeah. that there's all these little like gecko and lizard species that you can keep in naturalistic setups and yeah, they'll yeah. breed, they'll have offspring, babies yeah. just kind of show up and like, yeah. I'm getting way into, into that. And it's kind of Dude, a more cool. hands -off, man. Yeah, it's cool. It really is. Like all my day, I have a lot of bunch of, I had probably six pairs of giant day geckos and then uh, like three pairs of standing eye day geckos. And they're all living vivariums. And people are like, well, how do you get the babies out of there? Dude, I go through, it's like Easter Sunday. I go through and pull the eggs out of, I have the mother-in-law tongue or the zanzinia, the snake plants right in the front, right in there. I have all these little palms and everything in there in the background. And I just go through there and move the leaves, pull them out, pull them out. Pull them out. They're always right there, front right. Open the little exoterra. Pull them out. Shut it. But yeah, dude, you miss them down. You never really have to do much. And um, if I can go natural on a lot of stuff, I'll go natural pretty much in everything I can. You know, I didn't do the snakes yet. Like, well, I take it back. The venomous stuff I set up, like zoo quality stuff. But like, I haven't really done like a lot of people are doing like corn snakes and like you know fully like isopods and all that crazy stuff. I haven't done that yet just cause I have too many of them. So I, mm -hmm. um, you know, well, I had the green tree set up that way or not the green tree, the emerald tree bow is set up that way, but that's in my house. As far as my facility, you know, I do a lot of the racks and that kind of stuff, but, um, I haven't done like, I've seen some people do, I think you did something on, online. I saw it with a corn snake and like in a living vivarium and, and stuff like that. And I haven't done that yet, but you know, the, I had green trees set up like that in the hallway at my building. At my facility, and then uh, the emeralds at home, and then the king cobra and the, the rattlesnakes and stuff are set up with like leaf litter and cypress mulch and jungle mix and all that fun stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's obviously not something that you can do having that many reptiles. Obviously, there there is a place for racks and tubs for sure, and that's you know the yeah. majority of my collection probably like yours is in racks and tubs, but then again, I have my fun kind of uh setups that i like to just look at yeah yeah that's what i did at the house you know we had those at the house so when you it's funny because people are like he must have his house must smell and have monkeys running around and all. i'm like listen dude i'm married with kids all right that ended years ago the whole basement full of animals that before company came over you had to light candles because your house smelled like uh cypress mulch and when you first walk into a pet store and then my brother-in-law and people would come in and be like it's got like a nice woodsy smell and i'm like dude i'm done with this you know so i feel I personally attacked jeff okay i'm, so I don't I'm like sorry this is going. i'm sorry I'm, I'm like i'm sorry i, I <laughs> if you have a smaller collection of stuff you're good i like had the entire basement of my house loaded to the point where it was like all right dude i gotta i gotta move you know i gotta move something i gotta set something up and then that's what we start doing. You know, now I have these vivariums, which you can take good care of in the house. And, you know, you have the uh, emerald and the, the turtle in there and things like that, which are really good. But like, yeah, I, when you get into it hardcore and you have like hundreds and hundreds of snakes and things and you can start smelling it through your vents, then, you know, it's time to time to move on. You know, time well, to I guess it's time for me then. <laughs> When were when were you able to uh, to have a building on your property? I mean, is that what you did? Did you build the building separate? No, yeah. What I ended up, uh, I was offered some property many years ago with a pole barn on it. Um, uh, my father's friend, and we ended up buying the property, had the pole barn on it. I had a friend of mine, my one of my best friends, come in and just build all the rooms and all the doors and all the closets and everything and everything we needed. And then as time went on and the animal collection grew and business grew and we got another stuff, we started adding on to the pole barns and making bigger buildings and more outdoor things and, and stuff like that. But yeah, it, it, uh, it got to be, it got to be a lot, you know, but yeah, that was, that was probably like five, six years into doing it full time that we started doing that. And then, you know, like all the money I made just kept going back into it, you know, making better cages, getting bigger enclosures, getting bigger, taking down the melamine cages and getting all vision cages, taking down all the melamine racks and getting all ARS racks and just always like up in your game, you know, just always up in the game, always, you know, moving on, you know, but I'll tell you what, though, a lot of times I look back at it just like, 
I wish I had like racks in my basement and I could go down there and mess around with stuff because, you know, I I miss those days, to be honest. You know, I'd go off downstairs. I had exoterras lining the whole wall and I had leaf tail geckos. I was breeding the hell out of Henkleii leaf tail geckos and satanic leaf tail geckos, you know, fantastic fantastic is i was breeding the hell out of those but that was back then when they were coming in by the millions and imports and no one cared and then i kind of got out of it and the line day geckos i was breeding line day geckos like crazy or line not day geckos line uh, leaf tails and uh i miss those days we were just talking about that the other day but uh yeah man it was it was a lot it and those are lot. animals that people still to this very day i mean aren't super successful with no, it, you know, I went to a guy's house many years ago in Pennsylvania and I walked in his basement. I was going there to buy some monkey tail skinks, which I also love. And I have like 30 of them and uh, set up in pairs and we get great success with them. I just love the monkey tails. But uh, we um, I went in this guy's basement and he had I was buying some monkey tails from him. And he's like, hey, you like leaf tails? I said, oh, I love leaf tails, but I don't want to mess with all the imports. And that he goes come over here. And I walk around this pole and he had a bunch of doomeral boas and stuff. And he's got this like eight foot by eight foot by six, seven foot tall room. All the walls are in cork bark. Like the cork bark you get at like office depot. This is before like the zoom med cork bark things, you know, and it's all done in cork bark. He has hanging plants in the ceiling, mulch on the floor. And like, <laughs> like there's freaking Henkley eye and Fimbriatus hanging all over the walls. And I'll never forget the one, I was like, what are we looking at? And he goes, do you see anything? And I put my hand on a bamboo pole and this thing went bang, and like flung out at me and opened his mouth. I shit my pants. I was like, oh my God, dude, like I didn't even see it. It was blending with this pole so perfectly. He goes, oh, I gotcha, you know? He goes, I just did that to the cable guy last week. I'm like, oh my God, like what? <laughs> so I'm like, dude, you bring people in here and like, what? So he goes, yeah, hang on a minute. He reaches in this little like hanging pothos plant and he goes, yeah, two more, well, two more, hang on, two more. Can you hold this? And I'm putting wow. leaf tail gecko eggs in a box. And I'm like, are you shitting me? And he goes, yeah, I got a tub over here of a bunch of little ones. You know, you want to pick through them. I don't know, like how's, how's a hundred dollars a piece sound? And I'm like, uh, and I was kind of like shocked. Cause I was like, I think that's what imports are going for. And I'm like, uh, uh okay and he goes too high for you all right fine he goes 75 bucks a piece and i was like okay you know and he's like oh here you want these these are fimbriatus which i never had luck with but um the henkley eye we cranked out and um and then i got satanics from him too and they were in a different he had those in actual enclosures and they did super awesome too but then when I started getting more and more animals in the facility and the mammals and things, I didn't have the time to like get in there and miss them and, and do everything. I really, they were a lot of work. So I'd go down in the basement at night and, and do them all night long and get everything cleaned up. And, and uh, I loved it. You know, I miss those guys because now you never see them. You never see them anymore. Yeah. Uh, and not everyone can uh, set up a whole room with cork bark. Dude, that, is that, <laughs> that was in my lifetime that was one of those things like and i'm guilty of this people say i should do it more i just enjoy it in the moment like if i go to someone's collection i'm just like holy shit like wow you know and i see people's stuff or i go to a zoo i'm not one to pull out my phone like i wish i was more like boom video take pictures take pictures i leave i'll be driving home and i'm like ah oh, shit how did he have that set up i'd love to see that again i would love to see this i would love to and i wish i took i'm guilty of not taking enough photos and stuff you know i wish i did more of that but um, I don't, which sucks. But, uh, you know, that was like one of those things where I just should have busted out the phone and took some pictures. But that was like flip phone. So the photos probably wouldn't have been as good. But um, those are that was an awesome thing. I, I think about that all the time. Like he just had he had day geckos in there. It reminded me I went to Clyde Peeling's Reptile Land and he had that little hexagon tank set up. And he had he had Henkley Eye in there and he had day geckos in there. I'm like, oh, my God, last time I saw that was in some dude's basement, you know, in Pennsylvania. <laughs> like I went over to buy monkey tails from him. It was just crazy. But, uh, so this guy was single. No, he was like uh -huh. 70 years old. He had a wife, he had kids. The kids never lived at home anymore, but 
Yeah, he should have been. Oh because, man, you're just living his best life then. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't know anyone that any woman that would really. Do, well, my wife dealt with a lot, so. But most uh, I would say so. Yeah. yeah, dude, she's a saint, man. <laughs> she's a saint. You know, it's crazy. It's crazy. She's uh, yeah, man. It's it's. I think Mother's Day a couple of years ago, I walked a camel into the kitchen. I'm like, Happy Mother's Day, and she's like, Are you serious? Are you you bought me a camel? I'm like, Everyone wants a camel for Mother's Day, and she didn't find that too funny. <laughs> and she was pissed off about it on the floor, and I'm like, They don't even have hooves, you know, so they're not going to ruin the floor. She's like, Get them out of the kitchen. And then I tell these stories, and then the guy from that does all my YouTube stuffs like, That's the kind of stuff we need for YouTube. But so like again, it's just like spur of the moment. Like I'm going to walk the camel in the kitchen just to see what kind of reaction I can get, you know? Yeah. So it's whatever, you know, day in yeah. the life, I guess. So we've uh, we've hit two hours, but if you could, I mean, there's uh, thousands of people going to listen to this and are trying to be the next Jeff Musial. So, I mean, can you give them any advice or uh, anything to kind of guide them on their journey in uh, in animals? Uh, in animals, I just tell people follow your passion, follow your dreams. Don't let anything or anyone stop you. Like, you know, if you're really into animals, you get it in your heart, your gut, everything, your mind, and you just go with it. And don't listen to anybody that the naysayers, the people tell you you're not going to be able to do it. The people, I was a class clown, skateboarder, snowboarder, punk in high school. And I remember teachers going, you're never going to amount to anything. And I'm like, I'm going to be on late night TV with a gaboon viper. And they're like, yeah, okay, I'd love to see it. And I'm like, I did it four times with a Gaboon Viper, 47 other times without a Gaboon Viper. And I, I'm like, look who's laughing now, you know? So I never like, anyone would say something, you can't do this, you can't do that bullshit. You got passion, you got drive, you got dreams, you can do anything, man. You just gotta go for it. And Oh, gotta wait until the end of the show to, uh, to have that happen. That couldn't have happened uh, two minutes later. No, I know. You uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Just can't see you. Oh man, what the hell's going on? Hang on a minute here. Let me see if I got a freaking uh, plug. Maybe my phone's dying. Son of a bitch. Hang on here. Let me see here. Oh man, stupid thing. I had it fully charged up, ready to rock and roll. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a long show. Yeah, man. I didn't even feel like I was like, what? Two hours? <laughs> Where that go? I was just like, BS and having a good time. You know, I like the whole podcast thing, man. It's a good time. It's fun. It's yeah, fun. it's something that which at least, at least I hope it feels like it's not very formal and more fun than it is. Uh, you don't have to be on your p's and q's as much. No, yeah, it's uh, it's cool, man. It's uh. That's what I try to do, you know, I try to have a good time and just talk like we're bullshit. And like when I was buying that corn steak from you, I was like just talking to you like I knew, uh, known you for years. It was crazy. Yeah, that's the thing. Like when you get when you get on the phone with uh, with another animal person, you can you can talk an hour or two. Just yeah, naturally. exactly. All right, now I'm um, hang on a minute here. Oh, now you're a little gray icon. Oh, back to black. Oh man, I don't know what else to do. Camera, mic, camera, mic. Well, let's just close her out audio only. Okay, no worries. I got you plugged in. I just don't know why it's not, uh, why it's all black. That's so weird. So weird. Let's see. Yeah, I don't. Oh, there we go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go now we can close her out right beautiful hey man i'm just happy that we got two hours without any interruption so hey no that's awesome man like i said i was like watching it and i kept getting those things clicking out here that were like phones dying and i'm like dude i don't even have a plug anywhere over here so uh that I made it work, but we're good now. But yeah, that's cool, man. And I had everything charged up for you. I was ready to rock and roll. I was all <laughs> proud of myself. It's normally my no, you're good. The background you know? looks great. You got yeah, everything thanks. going on there. Yeah, I try. I try, you know. 
So if anyone, if anyone wants to check out your content, check out things that you've done, uh, want to book a zoom, want to break up with their girlfriend, where can they reach you? Dude, everywhere. Cameo, Jeff, the animal guy, YouTube, Jeff, the animal guy, uh, page start subscribing and liking cause new content will be coming out soon. Uh, Jeff animal guy on Instagram, Twitter. Um, yeah, man, they could reach us at my business as Nickel City Reptiles and Exotics.com or Jeff TV, I think it is. And uh, they can check that out. That's all the TV stuff. And you can email us there and someone will get back to you from the office and, and email and, um, you know, follow stuff on Instagram or DM me on Instagram or whatever, man. I'm, I'm down always talk reptiles and animals and hang, you know. Awesome. As for me, Port City Pet Everywhere, Port City Pythons Podcast on YouTube. You're listening to From the Ground Up Podcast. Jeff, it was an awesome show. I really appreciate you being here. Dude, it was a blast. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Love the podcast. Big fan. And uh, like I said, I just keep listening to him, listening to him. I, I love it, man. So it was an honor to be a guest. I appreciate it. Dude, it's awesome to know that people are listening, especially people like you, in which I probably have... Uh, I should watch what I say more, maybe, because I'm an idiot compared to some of the, you know, some of the people <laughs> listening are so legit. I like, I like it, dude. You're just real, man. Like, I like listening to you talk about reptile shows that you're at and what people say to you, and it just, I just like it. I like real people. You know, that's my big thing. I don't like, I don't like people faking the funk. You know, just be real, keep it real. I like listening to everything you have to say. You got awesome questions when people are on and. Like, you know, Ron St. Pierre podcast was probably one of my favorites. That was just incredible. He's a, such a good dude. And uh, yeah, man, it's it's uh, it's cool. I love the podcast. So big fan. I'm probably listening to you most of the time when I'm scooping camel shit or cleaning snakes. But um, long car car drives, I hit I hit you up. I even listen to some over again. Like, is that normal? Do people do that? Like, listen to a podcast and then like listen to it again? Like, I forgot who you had on. I was listening and they were talking about something or breeding something or whatever. And I kept playing it over and listening to it. It was, it was pretty wild, man. It was definitely cool. I wonder what it means in which my voice is associated with so many people cleaning shit. I wonder <laughs> what does that equate to? I don't know. But, it's great. It means you're the kook of us. Here's me clapping. And he has to light the clap. Um, yeah. He, anytime he hears that, he goes, um, it, it, it's a good thing. You know what I mean? Because they could be listening to something else, but I mean, you know, it, it, the way I look at it, if I'm cleaning shit, I want to be listening to something decent, you know, like you can only listen to so much music and, and things like that. So I want some good content, you know, I don't want the, uh, I don't know. There's some terrible podcasts out there. So, you know, I like, I like people that keep it real and you got like cool questions you have like some newbies on you have some old school people you have a little bit of everything it's just cool man i love it i love it keep up the great work i appreciate it you guys could be listening to anything in the world but you're listening to this clean and shit and i appreciate it That's and right. we will uh we will catch you guys next week thanks jeff no problem man thank you so much joe appreciate it brother